This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Why are we upset if we're creating jobs? Inflation is still a thing out there for the everyday consumer. With Lisa Mateo on markets. The economic calendar jam-packed today. And Michael Barr with news. Tensions between the U.S. and China have heated up even more. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. Tom Keen, Paul Sweeney, Michael Barr, Lisa Mateo's here on a Monday. Yep, absolutely. I, I mean, starting out, five day work week How for Lisa Mateo. Yep. Working Newspapers hard. coming up here later in the hour. Lots to talk about there. It's a global morning, sort of, with all the elections going on the Mexican election, yep. Derek Wallbank in India, the Indian election. You know what? Most people are just watching the meme stocks and exactly. going, what do I, why, are, why do my kids own this stuff and I don't? I don't know. The game, I mean, they're back here. I mean, it feels like, you know, 2021 again here. So we got some of the uh, meme stocks back. Hey, what does that mean about the market? Okay. Is it talk about the frothiness of the market? Give, I don't know. Come on. I mean, we need Michael Lewis in here to help us yes, out. Yes, exactly. Uh, among others. But there's investing, Paul. Yep. And then there's this thing called speculation. Yep. But the speculation you and I studied was not about having a laptop trading, <laughs> no. you know, off of the, the news from Hello Kitty. I mean, you know. Exactly. You're sitting in your basement with your laptop. So, But that seems to be what's coming back here today. But again, the focus is on, you know, the Federal Reserve, what the, what it's the Fed going to do here. We've got yeah. earnings came through pretty solid for the last quarter. Um, and we'll see where we go from here. But I mean, um, yeah, I, a little bit of a little bit of green on the screen. And I'm glad time. you mentioned the Fed because like in my morning thinking and looking at charts and all that, I barely I, I barely remember that we're going to June 12 in a Fed meeting. Yep. And before that, in Cupertino, we have the pre-Fed meeting. Yes, we do. We've got the uh, <clears throat> that developers conference uh, June 10th in Cupertino. Um, we, maybe that's where we'll get a little bit of an AI read coming yeah. out of uh, Rich, Apple. Did we talk to Ludlow's people? I know we got to get like three days advance to talk to I them, know. but okay, we've talked to Ludlow's. We're, okay. we're going to talk to Ed Ludlow here about the Apple meeting <coughs> coming up as well on Android on Apple CarPlay. On YouTube, subscribe to Bloomberg Podcast. Search there for YouTube Bloomberg Podcast, and you'll get us. I'm not on the live chat yet. I'll get Lisa's already out in the live chat <laughs> as well. We're in the Interactive Broker Studios to get you started. A Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Lisa Mateo. You've got it. Good morning. We've got green on the screen right now. This is after stocks closed out the month of May with a mixed session. Right now we have NASDAQ futures up about half a percent. S&P futures up a tenth of a percent. Dow futures, they are little changed. The two-year yield 4.86%. That's down a basis point. The 10-year yield 4.47%. That's down three basis points. To currencies, a lot surrounding elections. Tom was talking about this. We have the rupee strengthened the most in the year. Investors betting that a win would allow Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi to push through policies to drive economic growth. Then in Mexico, you have the peso slid. The preliminary election results there show really? the ruling party winning in a landslide. So that's moving the markets there. The dollar is weaker. Japanese yen is stronger. Euro British pound weaker. We have Bitcoin up one and a half percent at 68,855. Moving the markets, that would be GameStop. Right now, those shares up 97 percent. This is after Keith Gill, aka Roaring Kitty, not Hello Kitty. <laughs> posted what appeared to be a $116 million position in the company. Other meme stocks, we have AMC also higher. AMC up about 28%. And NVIDIA up 2.5%. Its CEO said it plans to upgrade its AI accelerators every year. Meanwhile, AMD is up a 1%. Its CEO said the company speeding up introduction of new AI processors now set to go on sale in the fourth quarter. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Uh, Lisa, thanks so much. Greatly appreciate it. We start strong. We had a great list for you today. I don't think we mentioned it. We did with the tease with Nathan Hager uh, earlier. Albert Chunas on ETFs. Maybe he'll talk about GameStop. Dennis Gartman on gold with us. We go to Marriott. Tony Capiano of Cornell uh, uh, with us here. Victoria Bills. Derek Wallbank on India. Marvin Lowe in Moments. And Kathy Jones on Bonds will be with us uh, this morning. But we start strong on your mystery of China. Free Bre Freya Bremish joins us. Uh, right now with T.S. Lombard, just outstanding work, <coughs> excuse me, over a decade. Their offices are literally uh, across China. the street from Bloomberg's offices in oh, yeah. London. Yeah, 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 right there. You know, you know, we're there, you know, they're yep. free, of, you know, I mean, the, the interns are there in the coffee house. Exactly, they know. You know, spittoons and, yep. <laughs> and all that. Free, uh, the Asia trade is a wonderful new effort by Sherry Ann and Heidi Stroud Watts out of Tokyo. Uh, Sherry Ann reinvigorating our Tokyo coverage. 
And they reinvigorated overnight with the Nobel laureate Paul Krugman, whose wheelhouse, for all of you that think Paul Krugman's like politics and all that, his wheelhouse is international trade. That's what his Nobel Prize is for. Free of Beamish, when and how does China book dom boost domestic demand? Ah, they they need to get their skates on because of the for, we've been running with this model for for two decades now, and I think the global political system, never mind the economic system, is is uh, is really struggling with it. They, we've had two um, <coughs> incompatible systems, two incompatible models running within the global trade and, and monetary system from from China and the US at two poles of the of the global economy. China running you know, market share orientated and, and the US running profit share orientated. And there are a few kind of ex egregious exceptions right. to that. But broadly speaking, with regards to the to the trade um, environment, um, China is the market share oriented uh, e economy. Well and, and I think you know, by by 2019, the old guard model of that had 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 run out of steam uh, because returns were simply too low. Um, but what they've done instead of instead of um, you know responding to to the the kind of the 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 um the the, the forecasts of of, of right. economists saying that they need to reorientate to private consumption okay. led demand, they've just um, dealt with oversupply okay. by creating more oversupply. But for, given the train wreck. Can you model 5% China GDP? Can you responsibly model decent growth in China if their demand economics is a disaster? No, I, I think we, people see the the exponential increase in, um, and, and I use that word advisedly, uh, in in um, exports of of, uh, of of green goods of of EVs, and they think, oh well, China must be doing okay, but. If you look at actual domestic demand, it's, it, there's a, there's, there is a train wreck going on there. There's, there's no um, bottom yet in, in property prices. Uh, and as a result, people are literally dumping the Chinese economy for, um, for, for, for gold. And my own leading indicator you know, that I always favor is, is, um, is M1 growth. Uh, and, and that suggests that nominal GDP growth is unlikely to get above, um, above uh, you know, actually 4.2% 4, 4 this, this year. Uh, let alone get to to five percent. So you could actually get real growth above nominal GDP growth because China is in deflation. But yeah. I think even uh, even with that, you're not going to get to five percent growth this year. See yeah. how she does the I mathematics know. there? Yeah, exactly. She just pops. <laughs> she starts out with a nominal, pops on deflation. Yep. My head's. I don't know which real. sign to take there. <laughs> Free is killing me on a Monday. So Frey, I mean, I, I mean, if we've got. You know, a Chinese economy that is, you know, subpart here. What does that mean for the rest of the world here? I mean, we talk about U.S. exceptionalism in terms of the economic growth. Um, but doesn't the world need a decent, solid Chinese economy? I think actually um, China retrenching uh, and sort of becoming less important might be a good thing for developed markets. Um, this could go a number of different ways, and the politics is a, is a huge um, wild card within that. You know, we can see easily how you could get some really nasty FX shocks over the next kind of 12 months or so. But the, the more optimistic story is that productivity growth over the, the period in which China was supposed to be the kind of the leader of, of global growth um, was was continually depressed, and that goes back to this idea of, of solving oversupply with over oversupply, continually relying on depressing returns. Um, the, the the counterpart to that in the real economy is is depressed productivity growth. If you're kind of digging holes in the ground and, and investing in housing, um, whether that's domestically in China or whether it's Chinese savings that are funding. Um, investment in housing in developed markets as, as prior to, to, to the global financial crisis. That is a very fundamentally low productivity growth prospect. Um, and, and, and I think going forwards, you know, there's there's a lot that could go wrong. But the positive the positive story is that there's there's going to be more investment as a result of labor shortages. And that has to be something that is better for productivity growth because it's businesses trying to improve their bottom mm. lines. That has to be a better prospect. All right, let's talk about uh, the UK. Tom and I are thinking free of coming over to London th this summer. We're checking on our suites at the NED as, as we speak here. Talk to us about the UK economy here. What are we going to find when we come over there? Yeah, again, I'm, I'm on the sort of medium term. I'm, I'm reasonably optimistic compared with the consensus, which just basically means that I don't think that the UK economy is going to literally slide into the into the sea. And that's, that's a <laughs> metaphor rather than a, something with regards to, to, to climate change. 
um, <laughs> uh, on the on the medium term, uh, I think China. I think the UK is much less exposed to the the, the shift of of China right. from being an export destination to an, an outright competitor, as 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 in Germany is is very exposed to. Um, uh, and I think that actually the high pressure economy that the UK is 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 dealing with at the moment. <laughs> Um, could be, again, positive for productivity growth in the way that we haven't seen for, for a very long time. I also think kind of um, once policymakers get out of the way, both on the fiscal front and on the, on yep. the monetary front, um, that demand can actually lead a, a recovery in supply growth. And that could be quite a positive thing for um, mm. parts of the index over, over the medium term. In the near term, I'm, I'm very worried that policymakers have over-tightened, um, especially in terms of the Bank mm. of England how high interest rates are, how long it's taking them to cut, and, and how much money they're taking out of the economy. Can't say enough about Freya Beamish's uh, work, folks. Very, very scholarly. Look for that at TS Lombard, London. Freya Beamish gets us started on a Monday. Futures up 10, green on the screen, the VIX 13.24. With our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Tom, Paul, Lisa, thank you very much. Claudia Sheinbaum is Mexico's first female leader in a landslide victory. Desde aquí te decimos, Presidente, gracias. The former mayor of the nation's capital and candidate for the ruling Morena Party won yesterday's election by a margin of at least 30 percentage points. For the first time ever, Mexican nationals living in the Chicago area were allowed to cast their vote at the consulate general in the city. Hundreds lined up all day, waiting for hours to cast their ballot. Among them, this woman who was pleased about the women candidates. It's huge. It's, uh, it's marvelous. It's incredible to see that two ladies are, will have the opportunity to be a president of our country. Shane Baum capitalized on outgoing President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador's popularity. She also inherited a rampant criminal violence problem and a large fiscal deficit left by his government. Jury selection is set to begin today in the federal gun case against President Joe Biden's son. Hunter Biden has been charged with lying on the federal gun purchase forms when he said he was not a drug addict. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin is in Singapore for the Shangri-La Dialogue, Asia's premier defense summit. Austin once again voiced concern for Palestinian civilians who are trapped in the southern Gaza town of Rafah. What we'd like to see, and you've heard me say this before, is, a, is Israel conduct a, a different type of operation, more, more precise if, they, if they're going to conduct operations, uh, with less collateral damage. Israel has continuously threatened to launch a major operation there to flush out Hamas militants. Finally, it will be the Panthers against the Oilers in the Stanley uh, Cup made final. for TV. <laughs> There's a happy fan. Edmonton beat the Dallas Stars in Game 6 last night to advance. Global News, 24 hours a day, and whenever you want it with the Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr. We could have had the Rangers in there. Okay. This is Bloomberg. Michael Barr, thank you uh, so much. How about the old and the restless? Over the weekend, I waited, I waited, I waited for Paramount to do something. Oh, my goodness. I guess it's up 4.5%. David Ellison sweetens his bid. Are you kidding me, Paul? No. Sell the damn thing it's now. Just, it's such <laughs> such a letdown. I mean, this company, you know, three, four, five years ago, as recently as that, could have been sold to a major You said like, with, like three phone calls. Three phone calls or to a private uh, uh, financial player. You can't give this company away today. It's really kind of sad how this is all developed. I mean, there, there it is over the weekend. We'll have to see. Please stay with us. Just a really interesting Monday from New York City. This is Bloomberg Surveillance.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And this Bloomberg Business Flash brought to you by IBKR Financial Advisors. Switch to interactive brokers for lowest cost global trading and turnkey custody solutions. No ticket charges and no conflicts of your interest at IBKR.com slash RIA. All right, to futures we go. NASDAQ futures up about four tenths of a percent. S&P futures up a tenth of a percent. Dow futures, they are little change. The two-year yield 4.86%, uh, uh, down one basis point. The 10-year yield 4.47%, down three basis points. Points. Another important week for economic data it kicks off today. We have a supply manager's report on May factory activity, the monthly jobs report. That's what all eyes will be on. That's will be released on Friday. Companies making news. Tom talked about it. Paramount Global sources saying David Ellison's latest offer for the company includes an option for a non-voting shareholders to cash out on a portion of the stock for about $15 a share. Then you have UK drug maker GSK. Court ruled that the company has to face trials in Delaware over whether it's heartburn treatment, Zantac causes cancer. GSK is set to appeal that ruling. Their ADR is down about 8%. And Boeing reportedly resumed deliveries to China of new aircraft, including the 737 MAX and Dreamliner. Shares are down about a tenth of a percent. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. At least thanks so much, Paul. Quickly here, I don't know what to make of this, but Boeing is involved with Starliner, which is directly linked into NASA, and they can't get the thing off I the know. ground. I it's been I, weeks. It's been weeks. Yeah, we had another. Yeah, so I'm not sure where we're going uh, with that, know. but let's do it safely. But I'm not sure where we are with that. You know, I, I got a call this weekend from Riley from St. Louis, and she's yep. all, you know, she's out in St. Louis, and she's all bent out of shape. I mean, I can't keep track. There's Musk, and yep. there's Bezos. Yep. And I guess there's Boeing. And, and somewhere there's NASA's in there. Virgin Air somewhere yes, in there, but exactly. they sort of... I, I, it used to be easy. You just yeah. asked Walter Cronkite. Right, exactly. He just went to it. Anyway, we'll follow that. Thank you, Lisa, for the comments on Boeing. Uh, this is beyond timely. Because over the weekend, there's a bull market in gold. There's, Gartman will be with us. Yep. Bull market in coffee, cocoa, orange juice, GameStop, the S&P, <laughs> the NASDAQ. Is there a bull market in bonds? Kathy Jones uh, joins now with Charles Schwab, the chief fixed income strategist. Kathy, I want you to address retail that over the weekend said, I don't want to own NVIDIA. I just want a coupon. What should those people do now? Well, we think there's a lot of opportunity for, us, <laughs> for income investors, that's for sure. Um, I would say, you know, you could look beyond just treasuries. You can stay in short-term treasuries. If you're in a two-year, you're earning 5% or so, and you can lock that in for a couple of years. If you want to lock in 5% plus for longer, there are other opportunities. You could look at investment-grade corporate bonds, which we've talked about. That yield curve is upward sloping instead of inverted, as the treasury curve is. Uh, you could look at some, uh, you know, MBS mortgage-backed securities. Those have pretty nice yields, the government-backed ones. So there, there are some opportunities. And, you know, if you're in a really high tax bracket and a high tax state, uh, municipal bonds, although Thank the you. nominal yields are pretty low, actually on an after-tax basis for those folks, the, the yield is pretty attractive. You know, Kathy, I, I think about it, <clears throat> how much credit risk I want to take. And I look at the U.S. corporate high yield. It's actually positive return this year, up 1.63% here. Talk just about how you think about the U.S. high yield market. Well, you know, a little bit cautious on high yield. So the reason it's up is because the coupon's so high. Uh, and so if you're clipping that coupon on a regular basis, um, that's offsetting a lot of price fluctuation. And that's fine, but the spread versus treasuries is of comparable maturity or even versus investment grade corporate bonds of comparable maturity is is pretty narrow. And that means you don't have a lot of cushion if something goes wrong. Now, things have been going right for quite a while and the risk appetite is still there to buy high yield. But I would I would allocate, the, the way to do it is to allocate a small amount to it, not to go overboard. Yeah, 8% looks great, but you don't want to allocate too heavily to it because when that spread widens, it, it tends to move pretty fast. And Kathy, I mean, let's talk about the investment grade side of the business. That seems very solid here. And I, you know, just from the issuance side, we see a lot of companies issuing investment grade debt here. I mean, should our listeners, should our 
viewers be buying this new issuance here? Well, you know, we think the market in general and investment grade looks good, whether it's new issuance or whether it's uh, in the secondary market. Um, it just depends on what you're looking for. But uh, yeah, we think they're pretty solid. You know, corporate balance sheets are pretty good. Corporate profits are just off all time highs by 0.6% in the last quarter. So clearly corporate profits are good. Um, and the leverage on balance sheet is, right. balance sheets is not excessive. So yeah, I think if you're looking for a relatively high right. investment grade um, stream of income, uh, we we like that intermediate part of the uh, right. of the IP market. Kathy, I got a 20 year chart, the Bloomberg Total Return Index. This is Lehman Barclays over to Bloomberg. We're thrilled to bring a professional Wall Street 20, I think it's 20 series yeah. <clears throat> of, sure. the, of the yeah. Bloomberg Total Return Index. <laughs> I go back 20 years, Kathy, and I got a lovely trend of great moderation. I'm three standard deviations loss there. What is your new sort of coupon total return actuarial assumption of debt? Am I trying to make 7% here over the long term? I think seven's a little high in that market. Um, I, I actually look at the, the, the current yield uh, around five to five and a half percent. And so that's a pretty good proxy for the long term prospects for, for returns. So I think um, we are always in the process of updating our uh, capital market assumptions. But yeah. I would say certainly in the five percent region is a realistic long term view. In the Washington Post this weekend, Paul did a huge mock up of a fidelity study yep. of everybody in their 401ks. <laughs> And so you're in your 401k and you're looking yeah. at the last five, six, eight years in a blended equity fund, you know, the Liz Ann Saunders total return yes. fund. And you're looking at Kathy Jones, five and a half percent and saying, really? Yeah, I know. That. I you know, know, really? So, Kathy, I mean, one of the things that we have to be on the lookout for is what is our Federal Reserve going to do here? I mean, I think, you know, we started the year thinking in a whole bunch of rate cuts, maybe six rate cuts by this Fed. Now we're down to like one or two. How do you guys at, at Schwab think about this? Yeah, we came into the year expecting three to four, and now we're down to one to two. Um, I think there's room for the Fed to cut rates. I think yeah, from what we've heard from various Fed officials, you know, they want to be absolutely certain that inflation continuing to trend toward that 2%. It's pretty darn close. We've seen, you know, year over year PCE, core PCE down for 15 months in a row. Uh, so I think, and we're we're carrying it out to four or five decimal points just to you know double check the work here. <laughs> but um, the uh, you know the point is that that the trend is still lower, and at five and a half of the upper bound of the Fed funds rate, you got roughly expecting two and a half, say in the next couple of months, you know, three hundred basis points of real rates. Yeah, that's really high, and so we think there's room to cut, even if the economy is not falling off a cliff, even if we're not decelerating in inflation at a rapid rate, there's plenty right. of room for them to do a couple of cuts between now and the end of the year. Kathy Jones, thank you so much. Greatly appreciate it with uh, Charles Schwab. Yep. Paul, over the weekend, you look at the Fed parlor game and Ed Yardeni, who's nailed this bull market going back two years, uh, really reconfirmed his strong feeling yeah, he bullshit. that X real estate inflation we are decidedly heading towards 2%. I mean, he meant no words about it. He says the trend to the end of the year is, is disinflation. Yeah, a lot of folks out there, Tom, both in uh, you know, academia and in practice have said, hey, we're, we're there. If you, I mean, if you look at the real-time inflation data, we are at or darn close to that 2% number such that the Fed should, in fact, be cutting rates right now. They should not be waiting. Yeah. Uh, but that's kind of not where we, you know, the Fed looks at a lot of data sets that are kind of rear view look. Um, and that kind of keeps them yeah. a little bit on the cautious side. On YouTube, live oh, chat. Good morning from Mexico City. Hola. The, the individual from Mexico well, City, would you please send us on the live chat a note, your thoughts on your election? I mean, it's it's extraordinary this this yep. this election. I see the Mexican and, peso, Tom, down three point one seven well, percent. Is that a big? That sounds I, I like mean, a big move. Right? The the Economist I thought did a very nice split on this, but does she have the ability, the politics, the courage to take on the cartels? Oh, who this does? is not I, funny. I don't know. I don't know. Serious, serious stuff. Yep. Red and green on the screen right now. Nasdaq up four tenths of a percent. On YouTube, Bloomberg surveillance.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. We've got red and green on the screen. NASDAQ futures up uh, four tenths of a percent. S&P futures up a tenth of a percent. Dow futures, they are little changed. The two-year yield, 4.85%, down two basis points. The 10-year yield, 4.46%, down three basis points. To commodities, we have spot gold higher at 2,331 an ounce. Brent crude, $81 a barrel. WTI crude, $77 a barrel. What's moving the markets? Well, we'll start with GameStop. Let's start there and see how much their shares up 81 percent and we go back to amc also their shares up 26 percent and then you have shares of medical waste disposal company stericycle they're higher they're up about four percent waste management has agreed to buy the company for 62 dollars per share in cash waste management down about a percent and finally fast fashion retailer shein getting ready to file for a london ipo as soon as this week may value the company at about 50 billion pounds that is your bloomberg business this flash, Tom and Paul. Lisa, uh, thanks so much. So we started out looking at China with Free Beamish, you know, the mystery of Chinese growth. And then we looked at clipping coupons with Kathy Jones Schwab, and she said 5.5%. Looks like a good turn. Yeah, that's not bad. I'll that. <coughs> Excuse me. Any no one week. cares. All we're looking at is why I don't NVIDIA. Yep. Lisa's given us the Hello Kitty report. <laughs> me that. Let's talk equities Missed right that. now. The show begins with. Uh, 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 Joining us uh, right now, uh, excuse me, Robert Teeter, uh, head of investment policy strategy at Silvercrest Asset uh, Management. I'm, I'm just going to cut to the chase. You are range bound, not much Fed talk right now. I think there's way too much Fed analysis and not enough analysis about the real economy, about real earnings, revenues, and frankly, real share buybacks. That's really what I'm focused on. I think that's absolutely the path forward. Um, Fed is really stuck on a hard pause here. Everything on valuation looks a little bit confounding. Rates are up. The Fed, Fed seems to be stuck. But the real path forward is through earnings. And what drives earnings is going to be the economy and profit margins. Um, we see some signs of slowing in the economy, but not recession. The real key is profit margins. They've been better than expected for yeah. quite some time now, and that looks to continue. There's enough gray hair in the room. Lisa, excuse me, I'm sorry. She's <laughs> still waiting for her first gray hair. Yep. But there's enough gray hair in the room. We remember when there wasn't a Fed focus. There wasn't, you know, you waited for Arthur Burns to show up with a pipe and look at the smoke signals. But yes. this is out of control, I it, would say. It, it has been a little bit confounding in that uh, I was talking to some colleagues about this recently of the, you know, the famous Greenspan quote, if you understood what I said, you misunderstood me. Uh, and that <laughs> made for a little easier environment in some ways as opposed to this absolute scrutiny on every single data point and you get a tenth better or worse on CPI and it moves the market on the day. Uh, but really it's important to look at those longer term trends and what's going on. Inflation's been stuck for a while, Fed's on a hard pause. So uh, like you, I look to the earnings side and there's just been a ton of progress on profit margins. Um, looking back from COVID till now, you've had revenues in the S&P up about 30% and headcount up only <clears throat> about 8%. Um, you're starting to see some, some progress on the margin front that I think was unanticipated. So does that lead us to technology stocks, uh, Robert? I mean, it seems like, I don't know, 15 years tech's been leading this marketplace. Is that, are they still the leaders in this market? They still are the leaders and they've <laughs> evolved in the type of leadership. I think one of the things that's changed is tech's gone from being a uh, purely a revenue focused situation, which it is in some cases in the semi space and some of the AI stuff, um, but also to uh, an earnings story. And you're starting to see, you know, more announcements of dividends and buybacks. There's a lot of profits and some of those profits being returned to shareholders in tech. That's a different story from 10 years ago. I mean, uh, it, Tom's been clipping those coupons from those you know, magnificent seven. I've missed it. Where else do I go if I've missed that technology trade here? So one of the things I think about in portfolio construction is having some things that uh, we think will be working in the future. And in that area, it's small caps. They've been really? uh, underloved See, for now a you're long going out time. On a limb here. Yes, uh, yes, <laughs> very much on a limb. Uh, they've been unloved for some time. We and others have been expecting favor to come to small caps. Unfortunately, some of it ties to that that Fed conundrum. Uh, I don't think the small cap rally will really get underway until you see some alleviation on the Fed funds front and some alleviation yeah, what, of financing costs. What, what's the what's the when you you look at the history of small cap rallies once every nine years whatever <laughs> what's the catalyst what's the determinant that makes small caps go 
I think there's a two-part catalyst here. The first will be the <laughs> Fed. When the Fed finally cuts and we start looking ahead and saying, well, you know, there's a couple hundred or more basis points of cuts baked in. That's a better backdrop for valuation on small cap, better financing Fill environment. Fill the punch bowl. Yes. But sec second part of the, the catalyst is that a lot of these gains from uh, margins are going to flow through to the small cap space. They're not necessarily the earliest adopters. A lot of this technology is expensive. We do expect it to spread. You're starting to see some signs of it, some costs coming down for adoption of AI or robotics. Uh, and as that spreads through the economy, the earnings okay, gain should so follow. How do you synthesize Dell? I mean, last week, am I right, yeah, Paul? Dell, right. Wow. Dell had a bad week, right? Does that mean AI delayed? I think it's a great example of why the, the focus has to shift to profit margins and earnings here. So Dell had a, had a great revenue story, but not as great on the earnings side, and the market punished that. And that's really the path forward, is looking for where will you find real profit margin gain and earnings gain going forward. It's called cash flow. Yeah, I know, I know. I've, I've Graham Dodd and exactly. TV. Was a great <laughs> exactly. Uh, fixed income, Robert. I mean, what do we do here? I mean, uh, do I need to be a hero, or can I just sit with my two-year treasury at near 5%? I think it's uh, quite acceptable to be very boring on the fixed income side. Not a lot of reason to take a whole lot of excessive risk on the credit front, uh, given where we are in the economic cycle. And the yields, as you mentioned, are, are pretty high on the short end of the curve. Pretty easy to stay put there. So, you know, a lot of folks are saying, I need to think about alternative investments. I mean, I don't know what an alternative investment is. I mean, I own municipal bonds. I thought that was an alternative investment. How do you guys think about al alternatives? It's become a much more challenging space as a lot of money has, has flowed into it. So uh, we do think there are some nice returns to be had in private equity. Um, but a lot of that requires selectivity. So it used to be that the easy trade was the, uh, the valuation disconnect oh, between on. public and private. That's not there anymore. So you have to find people who are right. good operators, able to improve businesses. Okay. It's not a financial engineering game. It has to be real business. I, I'm going to give credit. I mentioned this last week. Blackstone had a huge success with a Hawaiian property they doubled their money in there there's successes out there i get it but you gotta tell me with the delay we're seeing in monetizing private equity or frankly credit that the internal rates of return are coming down what's yeah. your inter what's the internal rate of return in your head for what the fancy people are doing on wall street yeah, there's such a wide range out there. And unfortunately, what I think has happened is, you know, private equities become a term like hedge funds that's one term and means a lot of different things. So uh, in private, we've been counseling a lot of uh, moderation in terms of that IRR outlook. And again, recognizing that there are going to be some, some problems there and there are going to be some successes. It's not a one size fits all area. How about private credit? I mean, that's a business that when I started in the game back in you know, way back in the day, the private credit wasn't really there. They came to me at Chase Manhattan Bank for the leverage loan. Now a lot of borrowers can go to this private credit market that really grew up after the great financial crisis. And I see a lot of capital going there. How do you guys think about that? There's a ton of capital there. And one of the fascinating things to think about, um, as far as I'm concerned, is the macroeconomic backdrop of that. So in the old days, if the, that type of lending was sitting on a bank balance sheet and there was a problem, it had to be dealt with right away. In the private credit space, you have uh, the lenders are, are locked in for a while. And yeah. you can take your time to deal with those situations. Right. From an economic standpoint, that's arguably good. From an investor standpoint, maybe it's a neutral. So 12 months from now, where's SPX? Got to go. Um, I follow the earnings, so my outlook for earnings is up about 10%, and I think that's where we'll up be. Up 10% nice. left 10%. in the market. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Lisa, was that too bullish for a Monday? No, that's actually not too bad. That's good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Robert Teeter, you thank you. follow earnings, Tom. That's so what much. I'm learning uh, here. This is important, and, and I really adore the live chat on YouTube. I want to read this in full. This is from a gentleman in Mexico. He's qualified to be on YouTube live chat. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, this is not, we're not doing punditry here. Quote. Well, all I can say is that we are heading back to a strong ruling party that wants to go back in time to 1970, where the PRI party controlled all, except now with a more Chavez style. That's as smart as any I analysis yep. I, I've seen. Sign the guy up. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Put him on there. We'll, we'll see. see. This is serious stuff. I don't make... Uh, don't, Mexican peso, I, Tom. I saw the fentanyl deaths in the United oh, States this year. Terrible had a 75,000 number on it. I, yeah. I can't believe that, no. but that's what I read. Yeah, and I don't know how, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure how you police that. I don't know how you yeah. how you deal with it, but again, uh, you this know. This is not Hollywood stuff. No. This is like serious stuff no. across this I mean, nation. Matt from Westchester just emailed me and just said, what does this mean for, you know, kind of their policy on the cartels and things like that? Is it more the same, which is, 
you know, kind of a light right. touch if for nothing else. And so that's an yeah. issue. We will see you and continue. We got a very strong Mexico City Bureau and we'll uh, yes. uh, have them monitor this in the coming uh, weeks. With our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom, Paul, Lisa. Jury selection in the Hunter Biden trial gets underway this morning in Delaware. The president's son is accused of falsely swearing on a form that he was not a drug user when he bought a gun in 2018. Former New York City public defender Brian Buckmeyer. The uniqueness of this case is that Hunter Biden's addiction is very public. Uh, just think about it this way. How would you know if someone had an addiction? That's usually a very private uh, issue. If convicted, Hunter Biden could face up to 25 years in prison, but experts say nonviolent first-time offenders rarely get serious prison time for gun charges. Mexico's projected election winner, Claudia Sheinbaum, will become the first woman president in the country's 200-year history. The climate scientist and former Mexico City mayor said last night that her two competitors had called her and conceded her victory. Shane Baum had between 58 and almost 61 percent of the vote. For the first time ever, Mexican nationals living in the Chicago area were allowed to cast their vote at the consulate general in the city. Hundreds lined up all day waiting for hours to cast their ballot, including this woman. For me, it's the most important election of my lifetime. Shane Baum said that the voting had been peaceful, but Mexico's largest ever elections were also the deadliest in its modern history, with attacks carried out against candidates and people close to them. One of the longest-serving members of the Texas congressional delegation, Sheila Jackson Lee, has announced a cancer diagnosis. After 14 terms, she gave up her seat in the House to run for Houston mayor. She lost and was fighting to regain her congressional seat, when the 74-year-old Democrat announced over the weekend that she's being treated for pancreatic cancer. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with the Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, Lisa. Michael Barr, thank you so much. We go to our social director, Paul Sweeney. Lisa Mateo, jump in here. Yeah, please. Uh, as, as well, I know Lisa's getting ready for the newspapers. She's got like, you know, two hours of newspaper yeah. stories. This I mean, there's weekend. a million choices here. Can I suggest there's a boom economy that Ed Yardeni's Roaring Twenties, we had family members this weekend try to get into restaurants, clubs, bars, different things in New York City. They're packed. Really? Okay, well that's packed. that's my understanding. Crazy oh. packed. Well, it's a good sign. <laughs> it's a boom economy. It, it's, <laughs> and it also goes back to this three day a work week, work from home stuff. Oh, I mean, please. everybody's out. I, I, folks, I don't know what you see across this nation, but Packed. Yeah. I mean, crazy packed. I'm going to hop on a plane today, uh, this afternoon, head down to Nashville. I'm guessing it's going to be packed. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, it's going to be one of those situations. Um, and we'll Where see. Where are you going? We're going down to Nashville, Tom. Music City. I'm going to see With some music. With the Bank of New York Mellon. Yes. You take it. You take in Jeff Hughes Golfstream. No, I, I'm gonna. You know, I'm gonna. Alicia I'm gonna go, <laughs> usually. Has I know. I'm gonna go commercial weekend. today with with the regular peeps, but we're gonna head down there, Alex Steele and me and we'll see how it goes but uh, we're going down to you know that to me is a great city nashville tennessee i mean i can't wait well they had the that. healthcare industry there years ago that really jump-started it with acres and acres of condo building but but the music I, business has <clears throat> never been stronger tom right i mean you've lived yeah this. yeah I, I i think that the music yeah the music business has never been stronger is true and what's so important like in youtube where people can actually uh, make money at it is is getting it so it's a broader pile pot right. and there's a there's some tension with Spotify uh, to to say the, the least. I mean you know you look at the number one hit in the country. I mean I mean what's the number one hit in the country? What is it's it? Me. I'm looking for a man in finance trust fund. <laughs> oh six, right, five, exactly. Blue light. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not exactly. Enough. All weekend at home I'm looking for a man in finance <laughs> trust fund <laughs> six five blue light. <laughs> Some girl out of Penn yep. State did this, and then another right. girl did this just charming video. Uh, <laughs> she, does, she doesn't want to talk to the guy. She no. just wants the keys to the place in the Hamptons. Hey. <laughs> Wall Street's doing fine. Good morning. Bloomberg surveillance.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Futures are mixed. We have NASDAQ futures up four tenths of a percent. S&P futures up two tenths of a percent. Dow futures, they are little changed. The two-year yield, 4.85%. That's down two basis points. The 10-year yield, 4.46%. That's down three basis points. We'll head over to commodities. We have spot gold higher at 2,329 an ounce. Brent crude, $81 a barrel. WTI crude, $77 a barrel. I want to talk about Toyota. It's actually stopped the sale of three cars. There was some safety scandal. It's starting to deepen. It's accused of falsifying or manipulating safety data. And then Paul was just talking about this. This year could be more profitable than last year for the world airlines. The International Air Transport Association's is carriers on track to earn around $30 billion in 2024. Post-pandemic travel demand continues. People paying higher ticket prices. I noticed more people on airlines too, just like <laughs> you did. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa, thank you. Thank you, Helene Becker, for being with us yes. Friday, TD yep. Cowan. Yep. And so I don't know what to make about it. And that fares are coming down. Economy's getting normal again. But to Lisa's point, Paul, the planes are packed. The planes are packed. Load factor is what they call it, Tom. And uh, the <coughs> load factor seems pretty pretty high at this point. So, it, But it, I, to me, you see it always has. Charts? It's always been. Yeah. Up. Yep. Pandemic. Yep. Crater. Still down. Yeah. I don't know what to make of it. I don't know. I'm, you know. We're, I listen to George. I Ferguson. only travel. I only fly when I get paid to fly, Tom. That's my strategy. That's yeah, well, it it's, it, you know. Otherwise, I, you can find was, me at the Jersey Shore. But don't, you, John don't you feel we're done the post-pandemic? Oh, yes, gee, yes. I got to yeah. travel. Yeah. We got all that. But I tell you, the international thing, I still hear it. I mean, again, John Tucker, are the only two people in this country that have well, not flown internationally. Uh, Charlie Pellet, Europe on $5 a exactly. day correspondent, makes clear Europe's packed. I mean, yeah. it's tourists, tourists, tourists. Yep. We're not even to the Olympics yet. No. We'll get a report there yep. from Catherine Greifeld, surveillance Yes, I'm yes. going to the Olympics. You're not correspondent. Uh, is she bringing Gus the horse? I don't know. Yeah, she is. Yeah, okay, yeah, there you Gus, go. No, Gus goes a special <laughs> plane as Gus well. Is a big horse. Now, a look at the front pages. What's making news around the world? Your daily roundup of today's headlines from major publications. And what a roundup it is, your daily look at the front pages around the world, brought to you by Interactive Brokers, their bond marketplace accessed. Their vast selection of over 1 million global fixed income securities, no markups, no built-in spreads, low transparent commissions. Learn more at ibkr.com slash bonds. Lisa Mateo, where to begin? All right, we're starting with something happening today in New York. This is really a lifeline for New York City families who are struggling to pay rent. The New York City Housing Authority, they're reopening that waiting list for federal housing vouchers, which you know is Section 8. It closed back in December because it grew way too big. It grew to 128,000 families. Now the waiting <coughs> list has dropped down to about 3,700, so they're opening it up again. But here's the problem, and the New York Times really gets into this um, fantastically, is that the city doesn't have enough apartments where the city vouchers can be used. So, yes, they're opening this wait it's list. A but it's I, a mess. I, yeah. It's, it's changed. You know, I see it from a rarefied atmosphere. Uh, we're at a life-changing moment. What do you tell your kids? Right. I'm like, you know, go, leave. But then what do you do? Yeah. Live right. with eight people in Queens? I mean, that's really what we've come up to. Yeah. I mean, that's I mean, Manhattan. I, I, I know it's always been a challenge in the city, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, it just feels like where are the new units being created right, in the city? It's, it's rent has to be at most around 3000 for a two bedroom apartment for a family of four. Yeah, where that? do you find that? Where's yes, that? That's exactly. the problem. What's that? Like past the Pine Barrens in New Jersey? <laughs> exactly. I, you know, I, I, over the weekend, there was a transaction in Washington where they're going to take an office building on K Street and I guess they're going to make it residential. What do you think the, the, the cheapest place in it is going to be one and a half million dollars? Probably. So. I mean, I just don't. No. I mean, this is an urgent issue to all of you across the nation. Next. Yes. Okay. Uh, so we were talking <laughs> last week when we ended off Friday about the dollar fifty hot dog combo at to Costco. Um, so you never let up. Another dude. big draw is also the rotisserie chicken. It's only five bucks, but also we talked about the gold bars and See, the coins. I don't coins. get that. You can actually buy that at yes, Costco. Yes. You can buy it at right, Costco. I'm going this you get, sometimes they're usually sold out. You have to go online sometimes, and you have to 
try and get in before every other people do. But the Wall Street Journal is saying that the problem is that a lot of people aren't thinking about the taxes on gold when you sell it. So a lot of people okay, are going wait, into wait the, whole, the whole buying You're gold not, thing. I, mean, but I know, Lisa, you can muscle a bar of gold out <laughs> yeah, the door no at Costco. I can. But with those biceps, you can. Okay, but Lee, triceps, I should say. But Lisa... <laughs> What is the gold bar? Is it like something you wear in a bracelet? Like, you know, you got your kids and your dogs no, on the, the bracelet? No, the actual, the bars, the actual <clears throat> gold They're little bars. mini bars. Wow. Yes. They look <laughs> like a Kit bars. Kat bar. Yes. <laughs> How much is each bar? I, do, I, I, do, I think they Don't, were around a thousand dollars or so. I remember then doing you the go story to, not too then long Then after ago. that, you go to the hot dog. And right, then, <laughs> then you go get the <laughs> you hot get dog. the bargain hot dog. But people are, are buying it up, but they're saying that people Have aren't thinking about this? when you sell Have it. Have you seen a line at Costco to buy gold bars? I personally haven't seen them. That's why I'm having a problem right. with this story. All right, that's what we're doing that this weekend. Costco. We're going to the Costco. Road we, trip. Yep. We Next. have to search for them, but I can't find them. Um, okay, so we've been talking about Netflix, right? Biggest competition, streaming services. But actually, Spotify has the most loyal fans. So you're comparing, you know, music streaming with video streaming. But this was an interesting take from Lucas Shaw. He said of there are course. two reasons for it. He had a good newsletter on this. Yep. He said because audio streaming services have this upper hand because Spotify takes care of the subscribers the way Netflix can't because Spotify has unlimited, you know, they will have every song that you want. Yep. Whereas Netflix has, you know, a show that you want and then you cancel it. So here's Lucas Shaw's yeah. uh, note here uh, from just a couple of days ago. Good afternoon from Chicago where I'm at a bachelor party for an old friend. <laughs> I would be back in New York the week of June 10th for a couple of events around the Tribeca Film Festival. That's how he goes, not Tom. Bad, he's not just, bad. Oh, he's life. just uh, he's I, mean, just, he's a I mean, he has to tell us where he is. People, but we hope to get Lucas in live in the studio. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to make that you know, call. My, my basic take on this is title and Koba's out of Paris are much better sounding, like shockingly better sounding. My kids won't leave Spotify. No. I'm yeah. paying like six Spotify subscriptions. <laughs> yeah. Vet Bill has one. Yep. It's you a know, big draw. I, I go with the old school Pandora and I get called yeah. in. And, and <laughs> uh, so is there anybody here in the studio that has a Spotify account? No. I, I don't. The nope. no. Hate it, hate it, hate no, it. No. They don't pay artists. You know, where do you want to begin? Right. Ooh. All right. I, I roll Tidal and I just wish Apple would buy Tidal and make it big. Okay. Tidal is great. I'm editorializing. There you go. Me. Got to there you go. It's All my right. folks' pop for the morning. <laughs> Next. <laughs> and this is the last one: the great debate on phone etiquette. Okay, it's becoming a, a fight with family members, coworkers, spouses, friends. Is it okay to call someone first without texting them first to let them know that you're going to call them? Right. Giving See, this is with warning. my kids, and I don't take yes. any smack from these numbers. <laughs> when I call you, you pick up the phone. Yes. I mean, I don't have to re prearrange. You know, a call. What is if it? I'm Do your kids you, have the little pink princess phone? <laughs> Only the rich kids had that in the bedroom. I don't know, man. <laughs> but I mean, it, like, they don't pick up when I call you. You owe everything to me. What pick I do, up the phone. What I, and some people think it's rude, but it works. I text them my phone number, <laughs> and some people I say as you can, and others I just text it because they know I don't want to be rude and bother them. Call me when you can. Oh, see, you're you know, really yeah. you're good. I like That's, FaceTime my kid. Yeah, exactly. He's like, whoa, why are you FaceTiming me without but telling me great, first? But that's a the great FaceTime question. Thing is, dead Do you, is it okay to call someone first without giving yes, them a yes. text warning? I didn't even know that was a thing, and, but now you're right. So it is, but it's becoming a workplace thing, too, because, you know, sometimes people are just, let me just call, you know, the boss and tell them this. No. Some people are saying you should text them first to see if it's okay to call now, you know, and they're saying it's wasting time back and forth. I can't talk to really? you right now, so just text me. It's well, have you ever, most of the last time you picked up a phone call that you didn't know who the caller was? Oh, I don't. No, Never. I don't. Because I don't. it's, Never. yeah. I and I see people spam. do that and they're like, hello? Hello? <laughs> and, and, there's, and they're shocked to find out it's like a spam, you know, <laughs> robocall or somebody, you know, trying to sell them something. But it's it's a generational thing because the Wall Street Journal is saying that the, the people who... Who um, who grew up with landlines? Those are the ones who yep. say it's okay, and the people who have been texting since high school no, say, yep. "No, yeah, you need I to text me first and that. let me know that you're calling." So that's the divide. Yeah, <laughs> well, I just, this is etiquette with Lisa. Yes, it is. I'm going. I thought we were doing equity bonds, currency. No, 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 we're going. <laughs> now we're doing phone, phone etiquette, etiquette and hot dog <laughs> uh, fair. That is Lisa Mateo with the newspapers. So what we're doing? I mean, it's like summer. It's summer, Paul. I mean, yep. for you, it's always summer. Always summer. Right? Were you and out with the Dolphins this weekend? Uh, yes, we were in the... Saturday was a mint day. Perfect day, Saturday. Yeah. So summer started. Oh, yeah. And the water's warm, like warming up. 40, foot, 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 40 <laughs> years ago, Mike Campbell could barely... He had, to, he had to show his ID to drink. Mike Campbell, who was just great with Tom Petty, 
did the demo off this song. It is classic. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. Are these stocks under-owned by institutional Wall Street? A lot of these companies talking about generative AI. With Lisa Mateo on markets. Investors just worried about the ongoing sales slump in China. And Michael Barr with news. A ship traveling through the Southern Red Sea has been attacked. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. Paul Sweeney, Michael Barr, Lisa Mateo. They let me show up this morning as well. Bloomberg Surveillance and Economics. 
finance investment, melding it all together. We're going to do that. Marvin Lowe in the studio is State Street, and he and I are on the same page here. We're going to discuss the overweight of Fed chit chat here as we go uh, to June 12th. It's it's the the month of June, Paul. I know June is here. It We're is busting here. out all over. Absolutely, summer is here. We got a Fed meeting coming up on the the 12th, and we'll see if we get any kind of guidance there. No. Whatsoever, maybe? No. The zeitgeist this morning is like range yeah. bound and yeah. like, you yeah. know, no guidance, no nothing. Okay. There will be the Fed decides. We're looking forward to it. Bramo leading our coverage there. Of course. Of as course. Well. Anything you know, all credit. Have to see. But lots going on. There's a lot of geopolitics, international relations, election in Mexico, elections in India. Derek Wallbank scheduled to be with us. Rich, do we know where Mr. Wallbank is this morning? Is he back in Singapore or is he still in India? Do we know that? Delhi. Delhi, there He's you go. Delhi. Boom. He's in Delhi, which is, you know, actually pretty brave right now. The heat is uh, criminal. It's, it's, it's really, really uh, difficult to say the, uh, the least. Bloomberg surveillance yep. this morning brought to you by Cohn Resnick Advisory Assurance Tax. Cohn Resnick can help you improve business resilience through a comprehensive risk management solution. Visit KohnResnick.com. Let me spell that C O H N. R E Z N I C K N I C K, KohnResnick.com, and we thank them for their decades of support to what we're doing here in economics, finance, and investment as well. We're on Android, Apple CarPlay. Really, download the Bloomberg Business app. It's free. Apple CarPlay is free. You get it. Press some buttons. Pretty soon, you're going to be able to AI it. Sure. Give me Just, Marvin Lowe, you exactly. know, that kind of thing. And that's how it's going to work. On YouTube, Bloomberg Podcast, search Bloomberg Podcast, and subscribe to Bloomberg Podcast. To get us started, our Bloomberg Business Flash, Lisa Mateo. You got it. And right now, we've got green on the screen. Stocks, though, close out the month of May with a mixed session. NASDAQ futures up half a percent. We have S&P futures up two-tenths of a percent. Dow futures are a little changed. The two-year yield 4.86 percent, down a basis point. The 10-year yield 4.47 percent. That's down three basis points. Want to turn to currencies because a lot of global movement due to elections. We have the rupee strengthened the most in a year after exit polls signaled a victory for Prime Minister Nareem. Rendra Modi's ruling party. And then over in Mexico, the peso extended its decline. You heard Michael Barr talking about this. Preliminary election results showed the ruling party winning in a landslide. Uh, landslide. We go to the dollar right now, weaker. The Japanese yen stronger. Euro British pound weaker. Bitcoin up nearly 2%, 69,098. Moving the markets, it is still GameStop. Right now, checking with those shares. They're up about 77%. Want to check with other meme stocks. AMC up 24%. We go to NVIDIA up nearly a percent. Its CEO said it plans to upgrade its AI accelerators every year. And then some news from Advanced Micro Devices. They're up 1%. Its CEO said the company is speeding up the introductions of its new AI processors. Now set to go on sale now in the fourth quarter. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. And thanks just so much, Lisa. Paul, there's names to the past. And they're really, you know, I'm going to pick on San Francisco here. Yeah. Guys like you, you get on the plane and you go out and you'd walk across California Street yep. and you'd call on Robertson Stevens yep. and smart. there was Thomas Weissel yep. and, you know, it was great. And the smart guys, like you read Ed Yardeni, C.J. Lawrence, wow. Tech, you read Hambrecht and Quist. Yes, you did. And they like owned the early Wall Street. They did. They owned the, they owned the internet. I mean, back when the internet <clears throat> yeah. was a thing, and we had to have people explain What's this to us thing what the internet. Google? What is exactly. Google? Yep. Part of that heritage is with Marvin Lowe, who did the tech circuit with Opco and Hamburg and Quist and others pushing along the way, and landed almost the, you know it was ancient history now with State Street Corporation, which really drives through their macro view. He's senior global macro strategist and joins us right now. You live the tech thing from another time and place. It does something do you different. Believe, <laughs> do you believe in this new tech thing that we have? Oh, for sure. For sure. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, you know, the companies that you mentioned uh, way back when, if you will, mm -hmm. ancient history, it's great to uh, have that in our memory banks, saw something that nobody else understood. Um, you know, the East Coast didn't really understand yep. how transformative, how disruptive um, these companies could be. I sat. In a, in a living room, and I think Chestnut Hill, with uh -huh. a hitter at Lotus, who <laughs> moved from Lotus out to San Francisco because of tax law. I mean, it was just yeah. because you, you, you did better profit-wise 
in California than in Massachusetts. Yeah. Now the big difference, Marvin Lowe, is free cash flow. Do you believe <laughs> in the free cash flow resiliency of this modern tech experiment? I, mean, I, I think that's such an amazing part of these business models. Um, you know, obviously the darling right now is this NVIDIA. Um, don't really need to yeah, mention really, much yeah. about that. You know, I think everyone has heard about it at this point. But to talk about growth while you can pay dividends is just something that's, um, uh, you know, just speaks to how vibrant these models are. And, and I think that that is where uh, we continue to look for those opportunities going forward. Marvin, State Street's everywhere. Uh, as a global macro strategist, I don't know where you start, but I'm going to ask you to start here. Where, where do you start here and look for opportunity these days? Yeah, you know, I, I think you have to really uh, parse out um, what the next big moves are for these central banks. This is still a macro-driven world. You know, okay. there are these wonderful micro stories out there that can create a lot of wealth or uh, a lot of angst for folks, but from a macro perspective, we're looking at rate cuts, and that's a tailwind um, across the world, especially when you look at, uh, it's not just the Fed, it's the ECB, the Bank of Canada is, is going to be soon, the BOE is going to be soon. The Fed will get to the point where it feels comfortable to cut, and then let's really see how much um, liquidity this uh, cutting cycle can add to this market. So does that take you to, and when we think about risk assets, equities, fixed income, where do you start? How yeah, I, I mean, so so I think, um, and, and, we, and we were talking how um, a lot of the macro themes are stalled at this point. So, you know, I, I do think that the low volatility that we've had um, on the FX side of things, on the rate side of things, can continue into the summer. That is supportive for risk. Um, equities have that natural ability right. to, to really continue its move up. Okay, listen to this carefully, folks. We're going to vamp here off Michael Mobison back when Marvin Lowe was at Hambrick and Chris. Mobison was a young Turk at Credit Suisse on the Leg Mason. He wrote some brilliant stuff on allocating capital. And the heart of the matter is his fixation on terminal value versus the value along the way of quarterly or annual free cash flows. To me, the world's been turned upside down. Does terminal value Val does it matter anymore, or with Microsoft or NVIDIA or Colgate Palmolive, is it about free cash flow 12 months out and then 24 months out? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I still think that terminal value is incredibly important. Um, you know, we buy these disruptive companies because they're going to be around for decades and they're going to continue to transition for decades. Free cash flow is a nice thing on the side while you're waiting for that to happen. So, uh, Marvin, I'm, I'm thinking about fixed income here, and I'm just not sure what I should be doing here. I mean, uh, I can get close to 5% in a two-year treasury. I, I kind of trust the U.S. government to pay me back in two years. <laughs> or do I take some credit risk here? Um, I think you take credit risk here. Um, I think you find the part of the curve that you're comfortable with that might outperform if, in fact, we get rate cuts that are a little bit more aggressive than expected. Um, you know, we're not really talking about hikes anymore, which is, which is just a wonderful tailwind from that perspective. And you can get a little bit of extra credit spread around an economy that still feels pretty strong. All right. Where, it's interesting. I mean, I, where are you I'm on thinking. Bitcoin? I mean, is State Street, are you, is State Street dived into the Bitcoin? We, 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 we're we're um, uh, casual observers off the side at this point. Interesting. What would make you change that? You know what? Um, this, is, this is not necessarily the, 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 the corporate position. Um, personally, I need to see a cryptocurrency that acts as a currency, um, one mm -hmm. where we use it for transactions. That's what it was supposed to be about. Okay. Um, it's a speculative tool right now. There's nothing wrong with that, okay. but you know, realize what you're buying into. Great to have you in the studio. Thank you. Thank you. Marvin Lowe with us with State Street Global. Decades of experience or global uh, strategist, just to say the least, just a real uh, success uh, there. Futures of 12. NASDAQ, I mean, Paul, up half a percent. I guess it's a lift in the morning. Yeah, 13. I'll take that. The VIX was 14. OMG, we're all going <laughs> to die. It's been a 1.3% drawdown. Yep. Marvin Lowe says it's not a correction. No, it's not. It's his big call. <laughs> his big call for the day. With our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Tom, Paul, Lisa, thank you very much. Jury selection in the Hunter Biden trial gets underway this morning in Delaware. The president's son is accused of falsely swearing on a form that he was not a drug user when he bought a gun in 2018. Legal analyst Professor Thane Rosenbaum. Hunter Biden is going to have a rough week ahead. Not only is he the first son of an American president about to be tried in federal court, the evidence that is going to be used against him, the testimony of ex-wives and girlfriends, and emails and videos that are contained on that infamous Hunter Biden laptop is going to return him to a very dark place. 
Rosenbaum spoke to CBS. Jury selection could last up to five days. If convicted, Hunter Biden could face up to 25 years in prison. The White House is pushing what it says is an Israeli plan to end the war in Gaza, but it's not clear that Israel is fully behind it. Bloomberg's Laura Davison has more from Washington. This is a classic case of, of one step forward and two step back. Uh, you know, Biden came out and announced this plan that would involve, a, a, you know, a six week, um, you know, see a six week uh, sort of pause in fighting, some hostage exchanges, then moving into a more permanent ceasefire and then reconstructing of Gaza. Um, this came out, you know, Hamas uh, appeared to embrace it. But then as you know, sort of the details and, and, and Israel was pressed on this, it's clear they had not signed off um, on all of the different tenets of this and that their understanding of what this deal is, is very different than um, both Hamas and the White House. Bloomberg's Laura Davison reports the White House says the deal includes a permanent ceasefire with Hamas in the second phase of the plan. Israel says it won't agree to that without destroying Hamas's military and governance capabilities first. California firefighters gained significant ground yesterday on a wind-driven wildfire that has scorched thousands of acres 60 miles east of San Francisco. The fire burned down one home so far and forced residents to flee the area near the central California city of Tracy. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr and this is Bloomberg. <clears throat> Tom Paul Lisa. Michael Barr, thanks so much. Bloomberg Business and Sports. Wall Street Journal Lane Higgins reporting winning the Stanley Cup is more taxing than ever. If you're playing in Florida, you do better. That's I mean, all there is to it. I mean, they've been in there for, I mean, Florida's, it's crazy. First of all, they, they're playing forever. I mean, this thing, is, we're playing well into June here, which just seems crazy uh, for hockey. And then that fact that this Florida team is there, like, all the time. Yeah, I mean, I mean. I mean we're the it, Canadian teams. If you, play, <laughs> if you play for the New York Rangers, you have a different tech schedule than if you play for the Florida oh, yeah, Panthers. Totally, uh, totally. Yeah. It's like real money. Yeah, exactly. And particularly, how about some of the, you know, the baseball players and the football players who get paid a lot uh, to go to some non-tax or low-tax states like Texas, like Florida and versus the, California. The salary York. cap. I mean, Michael Barr, have you covered this? You, you know, have you covered this? Well, yeah, I mean, with the sports? NHL, I mean, okay, let's be honest. We've got the Panthers against the Oilers. Now, in Canada, they're going to love it because, you know, Hockey is is God in it's Canada. Religion, yeah. Yeah, but here, that matchup. I'm sorry, it's not. You know, I'm I'm a sports fan. I just don't know how many eyeballs it will draw. I know it's just fascinating. It's good to see a Canadian team in there, though. That's, that's yeah, it's good. Yeah. It's good. It's yeah. not. It's supposed to be Montreal, but right. you know, yeah. that's not going to happen. So, but no, no Toronto, okay. no, no Mont Montreal. But we get Edmonton. They attack differently. I mean, they they run in the journal article. They run through 100 hockey players and. If you make three million a year, what you owe in taxes comes out, three hundred seventy-one thousand dollars is one of the deltas with California, as well. Uh, futures up twelve, and they lift during the morning. On this Monday from New York, it's Bloomberg surveillance.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. NASDAQ futures up half a percent this morning. S&P futures up two-tenths of a percent. Dow futures are little changed. Over to the bond market, the two-year yield 4.86%. Uh, down one basis point. The 10-year yield, 4.47%, down two basis points. Another week for economic data. Kicks off today, we have a supply manager's report on May factory activity, and we have the monthly jobs report. That'll be released on Friday. Companies making news, Paramount Global up 6%. Sourcer saying Skydance's revised offer for the company. Well, it includes an option for non-voting shareholders to cash out a portion of their stock at a 26% premium. And UK drug maker G GSK ADR is down 8%. A court ruled the company has to face trials in Delaware over whether the heartburn treatment Zantac causes cancer. GSK is set to appeal that ruling. And finally, Boeing reportedly resumed deliveries to China of new planes, including the 737 MAX and 787 Dreamliner. But the company, well, it also had a bit of a setback over the weekend. The launch of its Starliner spacecraft canceled due to a computer problem. Those shares down half a percent. That that is your Bloomberg Business Flash, Tom and Paul. Elisa, thanks so much. I, I, I called up the team putting the show together Saturday and Sunday, and I said, we got to get Derek Walbank on. He's in Delhi. And we want to talk to him about the crushing climate that he, with his leadership out of Singapore, is spearheading for Bloomberg News, the temperatures from India on over uh, across Southeast Asia, something in the heart and soul of Mr. Walbank. He joins us this morning off a small matter of an election in India, Derek Walbank joins from Delhi, uh, where he provides leadership out of Singapore. Derek, Modi has won, and he is dominant, and it is a tension of a cosmopolitan southern India, think Sachin Nadella playing cricket as a child, versus the emotion of Hinduism of northern India. Can Modi bring these two regions, these two disparate Indias, together? Well, Tom, it's good to talk to you, my friend. It's, uh, you know, look, it is, we don't do anything halfway here. It's about 111 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Uh, oh. And the, uh, the the world's largest democracy, the election results are coming out tomorrow. Uh, we got the exit polls just over the weekend. They show that uh, the exit polls, and I, and I mean polls, plural, there are a lot of them. They all are kind of hurting around this idea of a Modi landslide victory. They're sort of, uh, it, it depends in a range from a lot to really a lot. Um, what they're showing, if you sort of walk into the regional breakdowns, is you, you are seeing the beat. JP that Modi leads and his allies doing really, really well in their traditional sort of heartlands. But you're also sort of seeing a little bit of a pull in to some of those uh, areas where they've had some difficulties uh, in, in prior elections. Yeah. You are seeing a little bit more of, of, a, of a national move. I and mean, we'll have to see if, if the actual right. results sort of track that. Yeah, but you are seeing a little bit more of a regional spread. Yeah. And Paul, we got to color this. This is important. In America, we're hysterical about having three or four, maybe five languages. There are 23 official languages I know. in India. And then I mean, all the, all the dialects on, on top of that, yeah. just an extraordinary uh, place in the world. Uh, Derek, what does this mean for the politics of India going forward? Mr. Modi, what will he do coming out of this election and on the world stage, do you believe? Well, so let me put this into sort of two camps. Let me say in the India India locally camp, let's say that the the, the, the results track the exits. You are looking at a, a landslide victory in that scenario, but not a can do whatever the heck he uh, wants in terms of changing the constitution, all of that sort of stuff. So there are some there are some guardrails, I guess I would say, but it would be a very large uh, mandate where he would be able to operationally right. sort of go the same way. Your your investment sort of tracks there. I think on a uh, on a global scale, you know, it's look, it's no secret that the United States and the U.S. allies really like the idea of an ascendant India. Uh, last year with the G20 was a really big sort of coming out party uh, for for Modi himself uh, and. And so India really wants to take a place on the world stage right. that is larger than it has held before. And it's going to be welcomed in getting there. And I think particularly 
what you should look for is what happens when things go a little bit sideways, right? Uh, they had the, they had the issue with uh, with with Canada uh, in in recent years where where there was some real friction uh, there over potential extrajudicial killing, and Canada really wanted a little bit more backup on the world stage when they were looking around. A lot of their friends weren't there right. as strongly as right. they thought they would, because I'm right. just not sure that a lot of people are going to be right. racing to go confront Modi. They but, want him there, Derek. Just because the time I got to. Gui here to what you and the team are covering out of Singapore, which is to be polite, excessive heat. And the way you look at this, a physician once told me it's not, it's 111 in Delhi. It's if they're lucky, the low tonight will be 89 degrees. Derek, what is Bloomberg News reporting from, I'm going to say in a broad sense, from Manila to Dubai on this excessive heat? Yeah, it's it's absolutely stifling, Tom. And I think that I think one of the things that we're we're showing is a lack of infrastructure to be able to deal with it. Right. There's not uh, you know, the, you're seeing in some places uh, power outages combined with this. So there really isn't that sort of respite. I think broadly speaking, you're talking about places that are trying to figure out how they're going to live with this. And it's going to be one of the big challenges that well, Modi is going to be looking <clears throat> at is is building up that infrastructure okay. to be able to handle um, the level of the world that's okay, going to. Okay, but an unfair question, Derek. If New Delhi or Delhi <laughs> runs out of water, who comes to the rescue? I just don't know. I, I mean, it, it, and that's one that's one of the things, and you're seeing this in Singapore too, right, where you're, where you're saying, what are we going to be able to do in this environment? In Singapore, they're looking at building, a, and it, they're massive new land reclamation project that would function as a reservoir to be able to allow Singapore to have a freshwater uh, supply that it doesn't have to rely on its neighbors for. So this sort of thing is is front of mind for right. a lot of gov governments around here. How do you do this? Because there really is a concern right. that if things don't go right, maybe there isn't someone around to help out. Derek, thank you so much. On short notice, Derek Wallbank joins us now running all of our Bloomberg News coverage out of Singapore. He is in uh, New Delhi this morning yep. with a temperature of 101. And wow. the key thing is, Paul, in the, including the heat wave in Mexico City, not happening right now, I should say, in Mexico City, is what's the low temperature at night? Yeah. Now, we say because we're a nation of halves in Phoenix or Tucson right. or Tucumcari. Good morning, <laughs> Lowell. Uh, the, the, the answer is we have air conditioning. Yeah, we have energy. Right. But how many millions of people in India have a 90 degree 5 a.m. Yeah. And then they have to start in another day of heat. And to that's me. why I think Derek rightly <clears throat> brings up the infrastructure issue in terms of the grid, if you will. We talk about it all the time here um, about you know powering up AI. Well, how about powering up air, air conditioning for a lot of folks yeah. around the world? So One of our themes here to, to really look forward to into 2025 is the permanence of this excessive heat. Derek Wallbank is in uh, New Delhi. Uh, I, you know, green on the screen. I mean, Paul, the lead story today, forget about currencies, commodities. All those. <laughs> I haven't even looked at oil. Oil, Brent crude, 81, West Texas, South, $77 a barrel. I'm sorry, equities continue to lift. And after what we saw, what was it at 352 Friday afternoon? Right. I was into the second beverage of my choice. <laughs> Boom, up we went. Up we went. Yeah, exactly. So the market, uh, you know, again, I think as Marvin Lowe uh, from State Street earlier said, the markets, again, refocused again on some of these central banks around the world. And most of the central banks, ECB, the Bank of England, the Bank of Canada, um, and of course, the Federal Reserve, you know, appear to be on this easing mode here. The question for a lot of folks now is just how much and when. Yeah. And, you know, I guess for the Federal Reserve, it's going to be fewer right. cuts than we initially thought and maybe a little bit Talk later than we initially thought, but they're, they're coming. Yeah. Talk about old school. Victoria Bills at Banrion. <laughs> She's like a strategist, but she also has stock picks. Oh, that, Most of these oh. people now, they have lawyers that say, you yep. can either have stock spits, but you're not a strategist, or right. you can be a strategist and not stock picks. Yeah, yeah we'll play with that. This so is like old school. There's a lot of stuff to talk about with uh, yeah. uh, Victoria coming up in this Besides in White Sox Cubs. She's yep, out in exactly. Chicago. She'll join us here uh, in a bit. Let me do a data check here. Let me give you levels on futures. 5,300 SPX, 38,800 on the Dow. NASDAQ crawling back to 19,000 after that surge Friday afternoon. 18,700 on the NASDAQ. And the VIX was 14. It's in big, in stick. 
13.11. Bloomberg Surveillance on YouTube. Live chat out on YouTube. Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. We've got red and green on the screen now. NASDAQ futures up half a percent. We have S&P futures up two tenths of a percent. Dow futures are a little changed, down about six points. Over to the two-year yield, 4.85 percent. That's down one basis point. The 10-year yield, 4.64 4.47%, there you go, down three basis points. To commodities we go, spot gold lower, 2,332 an ounce. We have Brent crude, $81 a barrel. WTI crude, $77 a barrel. What's moving the markets? Yes, it's GameStop. They are now up 78%. And then we'll check in with other meme stocks like AMC, up 26%. Shares of medical waste disposal com company Stericycle, they are up 15% right now after Waste Management agreed to buy the company for about $5.8 billion in cash. Waste Management down about a percent. And fast fashion retailer Shein getting ready to file for a London IPO as fast soon fashion. as this week. Yes, my daughter loves it. That may really? be the value of the company at about 50 billion pounds. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash.
slash Tom and Paul. Lisa Mateo, uh, thanks so much. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. I'm, I'm glad Lisa's doing this GameStop <clears throat> stuff, Tom, because I'm not going there. I don't. I'm just not going there. So I'm going to let Lisa take care of our coverage of GameStop and the mean you stocks. You know, you have a laptop. Probably you'd have the new iPad Pro. You know, oh, yeah. If you're sitting on the, you know, the couch. Yep. Day trade or whatever. I, I, we'll continue to cover it, folks. But Paul and I are a little <coughs> suspect on it. What we know is at 10 a.m. this morning, the month starts on economic data. Jess Benton in for Alex Steele, and you're going to have the ISM data. Sure, like absolutely. And we're going to talk to some folks like from the important. ISM and get the breakdown. It'll be good. It'll be good. Our economic okay. indicators each and every day, including the jobs report on Friday, brought to you by Commonwealth, supporting more than 2,000 independent financial advisors with the solutions they need to grow a thriving business. Commonwealth, go where you grow. Visit Commonwealth dot com to learn more See, victoria Tom, bills joins us from chicago on mondays here and mondays at the bloomberg new york headquarters they have the what's called the monday morning meeting of the sales force the people that sell the terminals yeah these young folks that are we really call smart. them the people that write the paycheck that, exactly they take care of us they have their meeting at eight o'clock and it's now the meeting is being let out and you can see all these hundreds of young professionals actually coming into the office. That's what this is. And they're streaming back some, to their are desk. Are some of them a man in finance? Six, five? <laughs> yeah, <does. laughs> exactly. So, the, I mean, everybody's in there's, the office. There's a man in finance in there somewhere, yep. uh, uh, so ladies. Yeah. Victoria Bills charms us now from Chicago. Thrilled she could be with us because she writes these acute strategy yep. notes, which are be in the market and shut up and buy NVIDIA. Victoria, how can you buy NVIDIA after the moonshot? I mean, it's one of those things where when we're thinking about NVIDIA and especially, again, the huge spur that we're seeing in the growth with AI or what some people might even call a bubble, it's honestly, the price from here is honestly has incredible upwards bound to go even beyond the $1,000 mark. And, you know, right now we're looking at overall for NVIDIA, like consensus expectations is around like um, $548 per share. The stock has just done really well. It's very hard for me to argue otherwise. Like yeah. when you're, especially when you're constantly beating earning expectations. Like I just it's, don't see the seller story for it. Yeah, I think it's it's like through the highs that we saw yesterday, uh, as well. Now eleven thirty three is a pre market. I don't even know what that means. Ten for one stock <laughs> split coming up here. Oh, that's as right. As well, Victoria, at the bottom of your note on Nvidia, you go to what's different now which is it seems to be a new adult tech. From the view of Banrion, is tech really wedded now to dividend growth and share buyback for use of cash? Absolutely. I mean, when we're thinking, again, like the whole issue in terms of tech and how we're thinking about this is that like profit margins is well above like 75%. And when we think about, for example, how to capitalize or how to get involved in these technology-based stocks, I mean, whether it's smaller companies like Super Microcomputer, NVIDIA being kind of the top player in terms of what we're looking at with AI, but also cryptocurrency and um, like GPU, like how all of that is processed, how all of that is processed. Like, again, like I think that there is a great like buyer story to be had here. So, Victoria, I'm looking through uh, your stock list and a lot of, you know, kind of high valuation technology, biotech, healthcare, but then you also got a Diamondback Energy in there. Talk to us about energy and how you think about that in the context of some of your more higher multiple um, and higher growth names that you guys like. Absolutely. So Diamondback, when we think about basically it's independent oil, natural gas company. And a lot of what we're seeing right now in terms of whether that's um, the Biden administration pulling down on tariffs for um, when it comes to like EV vehicles, it's almost like a protectionary method, I would protectionary measure in order to kind of protect certain industries that are here. So um, basically, it's been trading at like almost eight times earnings over the past over the past couple of years. They have a very strong like team beh backing them, and then and then essentially again we have some protective measures that are coming in place where we're trying to be more cordial towards um, industries that are here within the U.S. So that's where I would see kind of the story for Diamondback. And then also just um, in terms of like free right. cash flows as well, well into the hundred, hundreds of millions. What's the value of cash within your strategy? Is it a bolt on or is it actually part of a strategy forward? So cash in terms of how we think about it for our strategy, 
So we are an alternative investment firm. So a lot of what we are advocating for is alternative based, alternative based investing. So looking at things that are providing similar returns to a 60, 40 portfolio, but um, have, like not necessarily leveraging on that risk. So when we're thinking about cash, it's great to have in kind of the short term, but investing in more newer alternative forms of technology and industry, because that is the future and that's the wave that, we're, that we'll be seeing that's coming down a year, two years down the road. But having cash in the moment, especially if you're someone who needs that for retirement or to buy White Sox tickets, absolutely a necessity. <laughs> So, Victoria, how do you how do you guys at Benrian think about just valuation in the markets today? We've had a big, big move in the equity markets off of these October levels, and we've had some good earnings. You know, let, 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 let's be clear, we did have some good earnings growth. Is that earnings growth enough to support this market from your perspective? I think there's definitely a possibility for that. Right now, what we're seeing in terms of small cap stocks, small caps are kind of making a comeback, but they're still not as frothy as we or they're a bit frothier than what we would want in the in the industry right now especially if we're think especially what we're seeing right now is when we are trying to um beat out the s p 500 it's the actively managed portfolios that tend to do much better than those um more smaller etfs so if you're for example looking for an alternative that would provide very similar return profile to like a 60 40 combination of equities and um, bond, equities and bonds, then a lot of what we're looking at, for example, would be CTA, right. IS, BTOL, MRSK, again, provide basically attractive, right. diversified ETFs that'll allow you to gain that same sort of alpha that you would get from a small cap stock, but not as, but diversifying that risk. Into June 30, Victoria, what are you seeing clients actually doing? What is the mood out there after I think the shock of sell in May and go away not working out. What's the mood right now? The, so if I'm hearing you correctly, I think what you're asking is like, where are people kind of feeling, where are people going in terms of where the yeah. equity markets are? Yes, So that's good enough. Yeah, so good question, good question. I, again, I think that a lot of people are trying to find that alpha out there in the market. We're seeing continuously high valuations. And so that's where I'm saying alternative investment strategies that will provide you a similar return profile, but again, like reducing that beta or even providing a um, similar return profile and then, but diversifying across a very highly concentrated managed portfolio. That's where I think a lot of people are starting to head towards right now. But I think the appetite for that market, again, is it requires a high, it's a high educational barrier when, we talk, right. when we're talking about lives but that's where i think a lot of people if you're being smart about the market and looking again for ways to get involved especially in industries that are related to like evs semiconductors that's where i think alternative investment strategies right. are coming in so you know, manage manage etfs are doing much better in that regard we, we got to be quick here victoria but you mentioned it i mean the chicago white Sox <laughs> back 55 years when i saw nelly fox hit a home run at Comiskey Park, it's like the worst team ever. What does Victoria Bills do to turn <laughs> the Chicago White Sox around? Hopes and prayers, thoughts and prayers. But I think that what they're, my understanding right now is that they're looking to move the White Sox stadium. And <laughs> I would hope also to potentially look at new management. Look, I, I am not a sports girly by any stretch of the imagination, but I am like how there are Cubs fans that always have supported the Cubs. I will always support the White Sox. There we go. Even if it's my better interest. <laughs> <You're right. laughs> my deepest sympathies, Victoria yeah. Bills. Thank you uh, so much. Thank Look forward to much. seeing you in New York again. She's with Banrion uh, Capital management Chicago. it's painful yeah they have adrian benatendi and tommy fam got had a tantrum last night Did he? Okay. they've lost 11 in a row I, I i'm forever i i won't bore you now with the story my grandfather took me to a magical opening day there once oh really okay it's a it's a great it's a great story but yep. you know we always had the detroit tigers yes no. okay. so <laughs> Chicago. white Sox. thank god for the white Sox. <laughs>
with our news from Detroit, Michael Barr. Hey, by the way, who did the Tigers beat uh, yesterday? Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, anyway, <laughs> thank you, everybody. Hunter Biden is at the courthouse in Delaware. He is about to be the first son of a sitting president to go on trial days after Donald Trump became the first former president convicted of felonies. Bloomberg's Laura Davison says it presents a political opportunity for Trump. What he likes to do and kind of how he strategizes, he will always uh, deflect. So he, he's asked about his conviction. He can just point and say, well, what about what Hunter Biden is doing? And, and, and um, he has uh, multiple times made false statements about um, Hunter Biden, his, uh, you know, and his father's involvement in his, his addiction and his, his money issues. Um, but this is, uh, you know, a, injects this new paradigm into the election where it's all about courts. Can we trust them? And, and you know, sort of what is the future of, of the ju judicial system? Bloomberg's Laura Davison reports President Biden is likely to monitor the trial primarily as a concerned parent. The final South African election results are in, and no party has won a majority. Without a majority, the ANC will need to agree on a coalition with another party to co-govern and re-elect President Cyril Ramaphosa for a second term. Claudia Sheinbaum became Mexico's first female leader in a landslide victory. Former government health official Dr. Anthony Fauci is set to publicly testify on Capitol Hill today for the first time in two years. Fauci is expected to face questions about social distancing, masking, and remote schooling, and whether guidance on those issues approved by the CDC director was based on science. Global News 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with the Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg. Tom Paul Lisa. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Michael Barr. Paul Sweeney, a, a smart story out today. I, 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 to be honest, I've skimmed it. Jill Shaw, Ellen Schneider, and Carmen Arroyo on private credit. I mean, you yeah. mentioned this more than just explain what private credit is. Yeah, I it's mean, like debt deals without anybody you have to go to a about bank. It. I mean, you know, just like private equity, Tom. We all have all grown up with private equity. You raise uh, capital from institutional investors and you know endowments and so on and so forth, uh, and invest equity. You do the same thing on the credit side. So now. You know, a lot of the uh, the big banks after the great financial crisis, well, uh, they had some regulatory constraints put upon them that made it uh, right. you know less desirable to do some of these higher leverage uh, loans. And so right. the private market stepped in here. A bond strategist at J.P. Morgan, Jamie Dimon, yeah. he says, quote, there could be hell to pay. That's pretty strong language from a banker. Yeah. And I mean, I, I can't imagine. I mean, when I was at the Chase Manhattan Bank, that's all we lived on was leverage loans because we can make a lot of money uh, doing them. We could syndicate all the risk away um, and just go back and lend again the next day. Uh, but apparently, you know, that business, again, has been curtailed to some degree. Um, and so sure enough, the private market stepping in and you go out there and you raise I capital. Mean, I, and you I hate some this. Loans. I mean, it's a pro article. I'm forced to read it. Jill Shaw, I hate <laughs> you. This I just hate Jill Shaw. She writes this stuff that I actually have, to, have read. to read. It, yep. I got to read it now. And so I will do that, folks, I promise you, because they go through a couple examples here below their comments. They say a $1.7 trillion dollar market in private credit yeah. these days. How about that? Let's see. She'll show same, I hate you. Same, same size as a high yield market. I'll read side. that article. We'll report to you on it on private credit. On YouTube, Bloomberg Surveillance.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. NASDAQ futures leading the gains this morning up half a percent or 94 points at 18,684. We have Dow futures, little change, down four points at 38,787. And S&P futures up two tenths of a percent, up 12 points at 5,307. The two-year yield, 4.86 percent, up down two basis points. The 10-year yield, 4.47 percent, down three basis point. Commodities, we have spot gold higher at 2,332 announced Brent crude $80 a barrel WTI crude $76 a barrel companies making news that's MicroStrategy its co-founder will pay for if MicroStrategy and its co-founder will pay $40 million to resolve a tax fraud lawsuit then you have Toyota stop selling the sale of three cars a safety scandal starting to deepen it's accused of falsifying manipulating safety data and finally Coca-Cola still the nation's number one carbonated soft drink but there is now a tie for number two Beverly Average Digest says sales volume shows that Dr. Pepper moved into Whoa. a tie with Pepsi for second place. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash, Tom and Paul. To me, I, I actually looked at this, this story because I, I remember ages ago, I thought nobody, you know, east of the Mississippi River knew what Dr. Pepper was and it grows. But the real story here is the decline of Pepsi. Yeah. What I, happened? Well, I think, I think from what I read, the focus is on the the snacks, the salted snacks. That's oh, it's free to that's lay. Pepsi. I mean, the company should be called Free to Lay. Free to Lay. I think that's kind of been <clears throat> it. Whereas if you're Coke, you're you're all in on the beverage. What biz. soda do we buy at Costco, perchance? No, no, there's no soda, soda in the Mateo no household, soda. Tom. Please. Yes. I mean, so when the so when the Mateo kids go out, they just go crazy. <laughs> they, they must go nuts. They get the, yeah. the super big gulp as soon as they get out of the house. <clears throat> Thank you. We'll have much more on this. We got we got to get in uh, Bloomberg Intelligence on this. Seriously. Yes. Uh, yeah, we'll get the, you know, Coke, no Ken Pepsi, Shea. We'll get Ken Shea on that. Yeah, it, 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 it'll, it'll be great. Bloomberg Surveillance uh, this morning brought to you by Interactive Brokers. Discover the future of trading with their next generation trading platform, IBKR Desktop. Download IBKR Desktop at IBKR, IBKR.com slash desktop. Thank you, uh, Interactive Brokers, for driving this show forward each and every day. The zeitgeist this morning, I've been really underplaying the parlor game, but the answer is the zeitgeist here is range bound on the Fed. And some people, I'm gonna uh, say Ian Lingen at BMO, yep. suggests that maybe we're range bound and the next two Fed meetings are sort of in baked to the cake. Joining us now, on his way to Jackson Hole, he's already oh, packed. Geez. Michael McKee joins us as well. Is it basically a Fed snooze to August in Jackson Hole? Uh, probably. Um, which will put all kinds of emphasis on Jackson Hole because everybody's going to want to hear from Jay Powell. But we do get uh, Humphrey Hawkins testimony at some point in July, we anticipate. And so that uh, would also be a big event as people try to figure out when or if. I've already put in the ticket, Tom, to see if I can carry Michael McKee's bags to Jackson Hole, so we'll see how that plays out. Well, it's out. a heavy bag because oh, the, trout, the trout fishing exactly. equipment, because he's on a three-island tour there. He goes north to Montana. And yep. Then, and where do we, and where do we go again, Tom, to sit down at the bar there? What's the bar we, we go, like there? Oh, the Million Dollar Cowboy. Yes, that's what we like to yeah. do. Okay. Yeah, you know. So, uh, you know, Mike, I mean, this, this Federal Reserve can literally, with good stead, just sit on its hands and not do anything, right? They don't have to do anything given... The economic data that's that we're their saying. argument that yep. we don't have to do anything because inflation is coming down and the economy is growing at a, a, a very good clip and so what's the problem here uh, so they are long-term looking to bring down interest rates because as inflation falls real rates rise and that's uh, restraint on the economy but they don't need to do it yet so at this point says who nothing Says who they don't need to do it yet. Well, there's 19 of them. Do you want me to name them? All? <laughs> I mean, basically, that's, that's the, the argument. Are that there all, any hawks left? All of them make. Uh, yes, Mickey Bowman believes that it is possible they need to raise rates still, but nobody else thinks that they are going to raise rates. They mouth the words. Okay. Not off the table. Then how important is the jobs report? I mean, people that you know, folks, it's like. 15 research notes in my head, Let's don't blame anybody, <laughs> but they're framing a little bit south of the whisper number, whatever it is. Do we have a possibility this Friday we get a crater number on non-farm payrolls and that changes the dialogue? Boom. 
anything is possible. We wouldn't rule it out. It's a, it's a greater than zero possibility, but it's not a probability because there are enough other indicators out there that would give you a suggestion that perhaps we were getting to that area. Uh, but again, um, statistical abnormalities happen, and uh, it is always possible. And that w it would freak people out. It probably wouldn't freak the Fed out. They'd want to see that happen for more than one mm -hmm. month, and maybe something would lead to a rebound. So other than that, other than the Fed, um, this economy looks pretty solid. We're going to get some ISM stuff this week. We're going to get some, you know, t including today, some manufacturing data today. Again, if I'm the Fed, the economy is in pretty good shape, right? So far, it appears that way. Uh, the n weak numbers on spending last week pushed down the Atlanta Fed's GDP now to 2.7%. Right. But this is in a world where the Fed and most right. economists think that potential growth is 1.8 to 2%. So right. we're still running ahead of potential, okay. and they're not worried. Mike McKee, thank you so much for getting us started. With all the travel yeah. you've done to see Fed officials cash in those Bonvoy points, for you know something at a St. Regis, yeah, I, can, exactly. you know, I can see it at St. Regis. Michael McKee, thank you uh, so much. This is a joy. Um, one, one of Afterthought's friends just got into Cornell high above Cayuga's waters, and I was explaining. I mean, why? What's the Cornell difference besides oh, you know, Gura used to go to the yeah. Rangovian Embassy and oh, Court big and, play and, and all that. And and, and the the answer is, uh, you know, they own like geometry. They own mathematics they do. Cornell. They do. It's like part of it. Math but they geeks, also own geeks. the hotel, you know, the whole hotel thing and all that. Joining us now like globally with, with they Marriott. I mean, you know, They're crazy. Hotels are a tough business. Last 10 years, 14% per year in Marriott stock. Last 20 years, way ahead, SPX as well. Joining us now, Mr. Capiano of Marriott is making his 90-day visit. How do you do it? How do you take a $432 room and parse it down to a 14% annualized return on your stock? Well, I think we tap into the, uh, the resilience of travel. And if anything, uh, during the pandemic, the right. traveling public came to the conclusion, maybe I didn't miss buying a handbag or a watch or another pair of shoes, but I sure missed exploring the world. Yep. And, and that, that human condition that, that has this appetite to, to run around the world and explore, I think is a fabulous driver of our business. Do you have pricing power through the Olympics into the late summer season and into Q3 based on what I see in airfares? So certainly into Europe broadly, uh, we do. We had a record summer in Western Europe last summer, and our forward bookings today are up about 7% over that number. And that's going not only into France with the Olympic benefit, but Italy, Spain, Greece, all of those markets are way up year over year. Tom, these guys are, they got free cash flow, two and a half billion dollars a year. And it's not like they're not spending money, 500, 600, 700 million dollars in CapEx. Where are you guys allocating your capital today? Where do you see the opportunities in your business? So a few places. Right now we're going through a massive replatforming of our most important technology systems, our reservation <coughs> system, our mm -hmm. property management system, and our loyalty platform. And so we've mentioned on the earnings calls right. for the next couple quarters will be elevated. How do you get people to call Marriott Direct, call a hotel direct instead of some impersonal thing like I'm going to pick on booking.com? I go to hotels where I can book the hotel direct, sit at the desk, you know, be sure they can take uh, Mrs. King's seven Louis Vuitton l luggages <laughs> in properly. How do you get back to that personal service? It's really through the Bonvoy platform. It's creating a suite of benefits and, and <clears throat> making sure through the Bonvoy platform we educate the consumer right. of the benefits of booking okay. direct. Okay. I'm just going to, this is what Lisa wants to talk about. So we're going there, Tony Capiano. How, the St. Regis Maldives Vamuli Resort. Boom. It's the best, points me. guy, Brian says it's the yep. best, you know, best St. Regis know, in the world. Do you link with airplanes so Lisa Mateo can get there for the one week in September? It's easy to get there. <laughs> really? Well, come on. The how does, someone, right in, how does Lisa Mateo <laughs> pack the bag, the little, you know, she'll have the knapsack thing and get to the Maldives. How do you do that? She jumps on Emirates, flies straight to Mali. And then there'll be a beautiful St. Regis boat waiting for you to See? take you right oh, to the dock. But that's resort. how you do it. <laughs> or if you really want a, be a beautiful view of that destination, you get on a seaplane. 
oh. which flies at about 2,000 feet, and you get to view all those beautiful See? islands. I've okay. never Ooh. seen her. I know. George Clooney could walk <laughs> her, in right now. Her husband's, Tony, come here. Her Tony. husband's rolling his Paul, eyes right save now. the interview. So, Tony, I mean... I see a lot of demand. The Maldives, great. That's for Lisa Mateo. But I see demand for the kind of the mid-range. People want to take those longer-term stays. I didn't know that that was a business until recently. But that really is a business where people want to take long-term stays. Maybe they're contract <coughs> workers mm -hmm. or something like that. Talk to us about that business. Uh, again, another interesting byproduct coming out of the pandemic. Yep. This notion that folks, even if they're a little sub-optimized, they can work from anywhere. There is a younger generation of nomads that wants to work wow. from anywhere. And so the ability, whether it's a traditional extended stay hotel like Residence Inn, whether it's a more uh, value focused extended stay product like Studio Res, our new mid scale extended stay platform, or whether it's a bit longer term stay in an apartments by Marriott Bonvoy, there is a consumer that for their travel needs is much better served with something focused on not a one or two night transient stay, but really purpose built to accommodate that longer stay. What are you doing with New York City? Yep. <clears throat> the, the cheapest hotel in Manhattan, oh, I think goodness. is $800 a night, I'm kidding, but what's your plan for New York City? Well, we'll continue to grow. This city is remarkable, and the, the pace at which it's recovered from a travel uh, perspective is, is a terrific story. One of the great benefits of having such a bra uh, broad brand portfolio across multiple quality tiers We'll continue to grow at the luxury end, uh, we just okay. announced. But at the same time, we'll continue to grow with our right. new mid-scale Our platforms. good friend David Gura uh, loves to have a Gibson at the old King Cole. Tell me you're not <laughs> ruining the St. Regis Absolutely Hotel not. first floor. What are you doing <laughs> right now at the St. Regis Hotel? You're blowing up the first floor, uh, floor of an icon. What are you going to do with it? Uh, we're, we're just updating it. We're making it uh, more convenient for our guests. We're improving some of the traffic flow. But we are absolutely not touching that iconic King Cole bar. I mean, this is great. And, it, and what's so great about this, the restoration of the painting at the old King Cole was like something out of the Louvre. Yeah, it's Did you get the invoice on that? Somebody that did. It <laughs> didn't come to me. <laughs> didn't come to you. Tony but, you know, St. Regis is another brand that we just announced today, the iconic Pelican Hill Resort on Newport Coast in Southern California is going to ah. be reflagged as a St. Regis as well. So it's a brand that is really This is growing. in Newport? Yeah, it's uh, Don Brand and the Irvine Company. Are you calling this it. Hotel Hilarion? <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, is this like a Pimco Outpost? Is that what this well, is? Well, I think be? they'll continue to be a valued client. <laughs> they'll be good. Tony, thank you so much. Congratulations on 14% per year total return that off of Marriott stock. And thank you for the 90 day visit My as, pleasure. as well. Mateo, M-A-T-E-O <laughs> to the Maldives. That's what I, 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 I see. I'll Tony, tell them to get your slippers ready. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Tony. Red and green on the screen, a lift kept on a uh, lift in the NASDAQ 100 up, up 91 uh, uh, points here in the NASDAQ, 18,684 in the VIX. You know, we're looking at 14, 15, some real stresses there in the VIX. Friday, and with that nice recovery Friday afternoon, the VIX now centered at 13.17. Oil in a little bit. I guess it's becoming germane. Uh, West Texas yeah, Intermediate, like $76 a barrel. We're on Android. We're on Apple CarPlay, really popular across 20 nations worldwide. And on YouTube, subscribe to Bloomberg Podcasts. Search Bloomberg Podcasts. I'll get on a live chat here, here in the next... 10 or so minutes. Got a wonderful uh, hour coming up. Gartman on gold. Bloomberg surveillance. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. We're addicted to the parlor game, the yep. Fed, the monetary ballet. Where do you see opportunities in a fixed income space here in 24? With Lisa Mateo on markets. AI affecting demand for cloud computing. And Michael Barr with news. Another legal setback for Donald Trump, this time across the pond. The best in economics, finance, investment, and international relations. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on Bloomberg Radio. 
Good morning, everyone. Tom Keen, Paul Sweeney with you on YouTube, on Android. Uh, good morning on Bloomberg Radio. Somebody came up to me this weekend. Well, you're still on Bloomberg 1130. I said, sure. you bet. You I mean, we're there on radio across this nation as well, but really building out the YouTube presence here live chat. Thank you early on for the comments from Mexico City on the election uh, down there. Not a small matter and goes right back into the cartels and the drug issues of America, Paul. Yeah, that's a that's a tough situation uh, down there. And of course, with all this onshoring and Frenchshoring, Mexico has become even a, you know a bigger relationship with the U.S. than it was before, arguably. And a growing one, and I guess it's been successful, but there's some real call for change there, and maybe we'll see that. Our Mexico City Bureau particularly strong, and we'll have a lot for you there in the coming uh, days. Bloomberg Surveillance this morning, we're brought to you by the CME Group, the world's leading derivatives marketplace, offering the widest range of global benchmark products across all major asset classes. CME Group, where risks meet opportunity. And we thank CME Group for their attendance here at Bloomberg Surveillance as well. Are they doing anything with Ethereum yet? I don't know. I, I, mean, mean, I don't know how to ETF? spell it. But, I, yeah, I don't know. You know. Uh, Eric Balchunas is coming <clears throat> in later, Tom, so we can ask Oh, yeah, him. that's good. We'll yeah. get an update. Thank yeah. you. With Eric Balchunas. Yeah. Uh, if they sell was on time. And I, you've I, got I Jess know. Menton oh, boy. in the 10 o'clock hour in for Alex, and you've yep. got key economic data there. We do. We have some ISM data coming out, so we'll break that down at the 10 o'clock uh, hour, Tom. With our Bloomberg Business Flash from the Maldives, Lisa <laughs> Thank you. And we've got futures mixed this morning, and this is after stocks close the month of May with a mixed session. NASDAQ futures up half a percent. S&P futures up two tenths of a percent. We have Dow futures. They are little changed. The two-year yield 4.86% down a basis point. The 10-year yield 4.46%. That's down three basis points. One turn to currencies. A lot going on with global movement due to uh, elections. We have the rupee strengthened the most in the year. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's party set for a win for a third year in a row. Then over in Mexico, you have the peso extending its decline. You heard Michael Barr talk talking about this. Claudia Sheinbaum is set to become the country's first female president. What's moving the markets? GameStop shares still soaring this morning. They're up 71%. Keith Gill, a.k.a. Roaring Kitty, posted what appeared to be a $116 million position in the company. That's also pushing other meme stocks like AMC up 22%. Then you have NVIDIA up 3%. Its CEO said it plans to upgrade its AI accelerators every year and advance micro devices up 1%. CEO said the company speeding up introductions of new AI processors. Uh, they're now set to go on sale in the fourth quarter. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Uh, thanks so much, Lisa. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Uh, a little bit of inside baseball on Bloomberg surveillance, and Dennis Gartman and Jeremy Stretch know this back time and again. Um, I massively delegate what we do here. I, I, it's amazing the good work of our team. And the team has brilliance here in the next 27 minutes by talking to Jeremy Stretch about foreign exchange and resilient dollar. And then we're gonna bring that over to without question the trade of the decade, which is Dennis Gartman gold in a weak, weak Japanese yen. So it's all dovetailed together. And I don't do this. Paul doesn't do this. Nope. Our team does this. <laughs> it's great. They're the ones that figured out Lisa needs to go to the Maldives, Maldives, whatever the pronunciation oh, is. Joining us that. now, yeah. CIBC Capital Markets, Jeremy Stretch. Jeremy, we've had dollar resilience going back to 2015. Why? Oh, well, good morning, Tom. And it's good to be on your radio show. Um, well, it is very much the case that I think it is still this pr presumption of U.S. economic exceptionalism. So it's still the case that the U.S. generally tends to outperform uh, most other nations. Obviously, we've seen a significant degree of fiscal expansion over the period as well. But ultimately, it's that relative outperformance. And of course, it is still that international dominance of the dollar as a global reserve currency, despite the best efforts of some other currencies occasionally to try and uh, challenge that hegemony. It's ultimately still the case that right. the dollar is still king. Uh, and so liquidity and or growth have conspired to really keep the, the dollar very much in the ascendancy over that period. I, I mean, I look at this, and folks, I'm diving into Adam Posen, Maurice Opsfeld, and Doug Irwin's 300 pages from Peterson Institute, basically on dollar dominance, on dollar resiliency. Jeremy Stretch, do you see any plan where we get weak dollar and critically a technically weak dollar that falls through support? 
I think we can see a cheaper dollar, but I don't think we see a technically weaker dollar. Now, I think in a sense, one of the things that I often find myself asked by international investors, particularly when I'm uh, traveling around and talking to central banks and sovereign wealth funds, as I do for CIBC, is this question mark regarding the ability to fund what is still a large uh, fiscal shortfall, and would that prove to be ever uh, a major impediment to uh, the, the dollar's valuation? And I think the, re the reality is that until the dollar's reserve status is seriously challenged, and that's not going to happen probably in my market lifetime, uh, it is going to be the case that the dollar can still maintain a higher level of uh, fiscal shortfall than other nations would be able to justify without currency pressure coming through. So I think we can see a cheaper dollar next year. I think that's very much on the presumption that we see stronger global growth and we perhaps see a more uh, uh, growth orientated uh, and cyclically correlated currencies performing better relative to the dollar. But I think the, the dollar's resilience is still very much baked in. So a cheaper dollar, yes, uh, breaking through key thresholds, I think, is uh, uh, somewhat uh, out into the middle to longer distance. Jeremy, how should we frame out, I guess, the central banks around the world, the Bank of England, the ECB, the Fed, the, maybe the Bank of Canada, who's going to go first? Who's going to be more aggressive in cutting rates here? Or is everybody just going to sit on the sidelines a little bit? Well, I think we've had a situation through the course of this year where we've seen what I would call the pendulum effect, where we saw markets prove to be very, very aggressive in terms of rate cut expectations at the beginning of the year. I think we've now seen that pendulum swinging in many cases probably too far in the opposite direction. Now, absolutely, inflation has proved to be remarkably sticky, particularly service prices in many jurisdictions. But I think we can and will see policy easing. So I think the Bank of England, sorry, the Bank of Canada, I should say, uh, and the ECB will both cut in rates this, uh, this week. Um, I don't think either. Right. I don't think the, the, the ECB will be following that through in July. But I think the Bank of England will be looking to cut in August. And I think the Fed, even in the current circumstances, I think still can meaningfully look at the risk of two uh, Fed cuts through the course of this year. So I think other central banks will act more aggressively than the Fed. But I think the Fed is right. still in play far more so than the currency's market pricing. We rip up the script now. We haven't done this through the, the morning. And my, my, my mistake here as well <laughs> is Mr. Stretch says, folks, we are talking about Lagarde cutting rates before Powell. Is there any precedent for that, Jeremy? Is this new territory for the transatlantic central banks? No, not necessarily. I think, I, I think you know, everybody always assumes that the ECB can or, or should be wary of uh, cutting rates or moving out of uh, a cycle of the Fed because of the presumption that that would imply that the euro would cheapen up significantly and that would create imported inflation <laughs> pressures. And I think the ECB are mindful of that, but I don't think it will right. preclude them from uh, policy easing. And I think we're in a right. scenario now where the, the divergent nature of the governing council, right. I think, is going to see the doves coming back into a modest degree of ascendancy, and that will allow or will right. prompt the ECB to be a little more aggressive than the, uh, than the Fed this year. Jeremy, to segue to Dennis Gartman, which we're going to do in five minutes, folks, widely anticipated on gold. Jeremy Stretch, where is yen, dollar yen, in one year? Well, in one year, I think we go up first. I think we go have another move up through that 160 threshold. But we I have think a strong, we, we have a weaker yen first. We have a weaker yen first because I don't think the market is correctly calling the Bank of Japan outlook. I think we're right. more likely than not to see the Bank of Japan sitting on the sidelines for probably uh, the best part of this year and probably into the beginning of next year. I think it's only when we get the next round of Shinto wage negotiations will the bank start to adjust policy. So I think it's going to be a case that we go a higher first, so low 160s, and okay. then and only then do we start to see a reversal, probably in the latter stages of this year, and probably accelerating a little bit further into the first quarter of next year. Jeremy, thank you so much. Jeremy Stretch, CIBC uh, as well. Red and green on the screen, futures up 14, NASDAQ futures up 6 tenths of a percent. With our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Thank you very much, Tom, Paul, Lisa. Now that Donald Trump's New York criminal trial has concluded, another highly political case begins. Hunter Biden arrived at the courthouse this morning for his trial. Bloomberg's Amy Morris has the latest. President Biden's son, Hunter Biden, goes on trial today on charges of possessing a gun while on drugs. 
The trial in Delaware is only one of the cases facing Hunter Biden. His other trial in Los Angeles is on income tax evasion charges. That one is now slated for September, right in the middle of the presidential campaign. The younger Biden faces as many as 17 years in prison if convicted of all of the tax charges, but would likely face less time. Two of the gun counts carry maximum prison time of 10 years. The third is punishable by up to five years. Amy Morris, Bloomberg Radio. Jury selection is expected to last about five days. History is being made in Mexico. Claudia Sheinbaum is poised to become the country's first female president, and she's doing it in a landslide fashion. It's important to say that even in our lower results, expected by the preliminary results, we've got the majority of the Congress, deputies, and most probably in the Senate too. Claudia Sheinbaum spoke through an interpreter as early results showed her winning by at least 30 percentage points. Wildfire evacuation orders near San Francisco have been lifted. A big fire in Tracy, California is now 50 percent contained this morning. Wildfire started near the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory about 50 miles east of San Francisco. Several homeowners in San Joaquin County were forced to evacuate, including this woman. My husband came home and he was like, you have five minutes, pack stuff for the kids, and he's like, you need to get out of here. The corral fire began Saturday afternoon. Flames spread quickly, fueled by dry grass, high winds, and high temperatures. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it. With the Bloomberg News Now, I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul, Lisa. All right, Michael Barr, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Tom, I have to admit, I have no idea. I had no idea where the Maldives are. They are in the Indian Ocean, oh, yeah. off the southern tip of India, sitting right on the equator. Tom, I don't know how we're going to get Lisa Mateo to the Maldives. Well, I mean, Tony's selling it. Tony Capiano was, <laughs> Marriott was selling it But that's all large. I see people post on social media is their trip to the Maldives. I'm I mean, like, where? Yeah. Why Lisa am I may want to take. Loop? <laughs> she may want to take Mr. Mateo. I'm not sure. Okay, okay. But if it looks awesome. I oh, mean, yeah. The, the if you can get there. Amazing. If yeah. you can get there. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, no, I'm ever. vacationing in Detroit, and yeah. it's like, you guys are going to. Oh, my. No, we're sending Lisa to the Maldives. Last year, you were in Toledo. Yeah, right? that's right. You <laughs> step up. Go mud hens. Okay, there you go. No, but the thing here, and, and Tony said it, and it's yep. just, it's what the kids do. I mean, yep. you know, like, what, I'm on air tuition. Well, my, but, my but, number one <laughs> B offspring, I have twins, 1A and 1B. 1B is in Switzerland as we speak. Nice. Exactly. No, no idea. They get a knapsack, exactly. they fly economy, exactly. and, you know, they're eating, they're eating the whole way at McDonald's. <laughs> all I mean, on they're, points. They're like, shut up, Dad, it's cheap. Yep. All yep. on yep. points, you, very impressive. No, yeah, but you go into points. Emirates. You go, you go into Dubai and get the map out. Dubai, it's, it, it's like O'Hare for the rest of the world. I mean, you know, <laughs> yep. without exaggeration. Yep. And All then right, you're so in the Maldives and, you know, you got to extend it a couple of days, Lisa. You got to pop six, seven days. You oh, yeah. We're not oh, go. It's not like yeah. a weekend. Yeah. It's got to be a long 10, yeah. 10 at yeah. least. I, I would call your good friend Tony and see what the St. Regis can do here. <laughs> there you go. Uh, we just had an important conversation. And I put out there and Jeremy Stretch talking about Yen weaker and then later this year, Yen stronger. You got to stay with us, folks. Dennis Gartman is the pinata of the equity business. People love to trash on him. He has the call of a decade, which is shut up and buy gold and buy it in weak euro, weak yen. And just you look at the response off the pandemic and even off 10 years before that. And it's just it's like buying NVIDIA way, way back. Coming up, Dennis Gartman is going to join us here on gold in yen, and we'll get an important update. From New York, Bloomberg Surveillance.
Markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. Right now, we have futures mix. NASDAQ futures up half percent. S&P futures up two tenths of percent, or 12 points. At Dow futures, they are a little changed, down about six points. Over to the two-year yield, 4.87 percent. That's a little change. A 10-year yield, 4.47 percent, and that's down three basis points. We have spot gold higher at 2,334 an ounce. Brent crude, $80 a barrel. WTI crude at $76 a barrel. Want to point out, Spotify, their shares up. Five percent. The company says it's going to raise prices in the U.S. for its premium service. That's starting July from $10.99 a month to $11.99 a month. Who's this? Spotify. Oh, yeah, okay. see, we were just talking about them before. Exactly. Okay. And then we have UK drug maker GSK. That's after a court ruling the company has to face trials in Delaware over whether the heartburn treatment Zantac causes cancer. GSK, though, set to appeal that ruling. And then shares of waste, uh, medical waste disposal company <coughs> Stericycle. They're higher this morning. Waste management agreed to buy the company for $62 per share in cash. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Lisa, thanks so much. What a great half hour. Jeremy Stretch with us on Dollar Dynamics yep. out of CNBC Toronto and London. And now joining us on the edge of a golf course. <laughs> you know, he, he's like triangulated between three golf courses. That's the way you do it. I mean, you know, I, I, I think the caddy shows up at 5 a.m. and yep. he's out doing it. He's getting in nine holes yeah. before the He knows what he's starts. doing. D. Gartman joins us on YouTube Worldwide and, of course, across all of Bloomberg Radio and Apple CarPlay. Here's a number. Somebody just asked me the number. Since the financial crisis, gold and yen is up 355%, 9% per year, maybe a bit more. 10 years trailing, it's up 20, 21% per year, up 177%. And off the pandemic, the gloom of February of 2020, it's up again 20%, up 105%. Dennis Gartman, there was a, name, a guy named Weinberg, I think, at Goldman Sachs a few years ago, who said the trees, they do not grow to the sky. <laughs> when do you say enough on your iconic trade? It's going to be years before I say enough in, in gold versus yen terms. I think when I first started trading back in the early 1970s, trading foreign exchange for NCNB, I can remember trading spot dollar yen at 250 and 275 yen to the dollar. Right now we're trading, wow. what, 127 yen to the dollar. And I think we're going to go right. through 160. We're trading 157 yen to the dollar, excuse me. And I think uh, we've seen the Bank of Japan come in and intervene at... Uh, that worked out. Yeah, it worked out for about a day or two. And I think once we go back to 160 again, we're trading to 175, 200, 225 wow. yen to the dollar over the course of the next several years. And I think gold in dollar terms remains basically moving from the lower left to the upper right. So right. gold in yen terms is going to move dramatically farther from the lower left to the upper right. It's been a good trade for the last uh, four right. or five years. I think it's going to be a good trade for the next uh, five to 10 years. The dollar right. will get demonstrably stronger. The yen will get demonstrably weaker over the course of the next several years. Watch what happens when the Bank of Japan intervenes again at 160. If it trades 160.50, it'll trade 175 right. in, the, in, in the course of a few weeks after that. Yeah. So that's wow. yeah. that's an important area to watch. You Keep know, an eye on that. Dennis, I know your summer reading is a history of the Democratic Party. Um, I'm reading <laughs> I'm reading Doug Irwin and Maurice Osfeld's book on foreign exchange. I mean, that's you know, it's like a nerd <laughs> patrol. Talk about a guy magnet on the beach. Yeah. And, and Dennis, the heart of the matter is, is dollar dominance in the solution for so many countries, like a beleaguered China, like a beleaguered Japan, is currency depreciation, in some cases use the word devaluation. Do you see that trend continuing where we have dollar resilience? I think we, I, I think we shall continue to see that happen. We'll, we'll, we'll probably see the uh, the uh, dollar versus renminbi, renminbi trade above eight, maybe eight and a half over the course of the next mm -hmm. several years. But again, watch what happens to dollar yen as we go through. If if we go through, and I think we shall go through 160, the the Bank of Japan will come in and intervene at 160 again, trying to to stem the dollar strength. They won't uh, succeed. They succeeded for about three days last time. They'll this time that'll be even less time. Uh, for success, and we'll trade to uh, 175 very quickly. So, yeah, dollar gold in yen terms is is has mm -hmm. been a great trade. I think it's going to continue to be a very good trade for the for the coming several years. Certainly for the coming several months, no question about that. Dennis, let me ask the uh, the silly question: 
Who's buying this gold? Central banks predominantly. The public has been in, but not as much as central banks. It's been a central banker's uh, heyday for the past year or two, and I see no reason to think that that's going to change. Bank of China has been a, a demonstrative buyer. The uh, bank in Russia has been a demonstrative buyer, and those have been the, the great supports, and they're going to continue to be the supporting factors in the, in the gold market. No, Why are no they question. buying gold? Why aren't they just buying U.S. Treasuries? They can get a nice, you know, close to 5% on a two-year Treasury. It's a good question. It deserves a better answer than I'm capable of giving. <laughs> Obviously, they, they believe that uh, the, that gold will outpace uh, the the 5% return on two years on two year Treasuries. So that's clearly that's the reason for it. Uh, no other right. no other reason going. Dennis, in the time we've got left, we've got to turn to the equity market. Is a pinata of the punditry business. You've been run over by trading. Have you been successful recently? And do you trade equities? Do you just hold them forever, or do you run? I run, oh, and no. uh, at, at 73 years old, uh, my propensity to hold any, any demonstratively large uh, position in equities is very slim. Uh, actually, for the first time in a long period of time, I actually got modestly, and the operative word here is modestly, net short via the VIX but Tuesday, or Thursday of two weeks ago, uh, and I still have that trade on, but it's it's very, very small by, by normal standards. My 85 to 90 percent of what I own is either in gold or in uh, or in two two to three year treasuries, predominantly two to three well, year treasuries. I, I I enjoy getting the five percent return that I'm getting for two. two <laughs> There's or three confusion on the VIX, Dennis. To be clear, let's discuss this trade. You're betting on a VIX moving from fourteen to what? Fourteen to twenty, twenty two over the time. We'll, so you're short the market like, off of the VIX. I'm short the market off of the VIX, but again. Very small, it's a, a tiny little position uh, at, at this point. I won't add to it till we trade the the Vixie, which is what which is the trade to be that I use. Right. I won't trade. The, I won't add to it until okay. I get the Vixie okay. uh, look, profitable look, again. You know, me. page A to the old Gartman letter. I mean, everybody read it. There's that iconic photo, uh, Paul, of of, of they're, they're telling everybody at Lehman the world's over yep. on August of two seven, and you look at the computer screens through the people listening to the fact their world's over, and they're all reading the Gartman letter. Dennis, I, I'm sorry, but the tech rally this time around is different than 1999. I got share buybacks, I got free cash flow, I got profit, I got basically monopoly. Do you agree with that, or is it the same old collapse waiting to happen? It's not the same old collapse. This is di different than what we had in, in 1999, 2000, 2001. Clearly, Nvidia is, is the is the market itself right now, and it probably shall continue to be. They they clearly have a for lack of a better term, your term monopoly is is I think as good a, a right. terminology as we're going to get, and it's going to probably going to continue. Uh, clearly, Chat uh, GBT or GPT or whatever they call it, has, AI has been the driving force. It's going to continue to be a driving force, right. and I've missed it. Let's be honest. Okay. De well, okay. Nothing wrong. I'll, I'll say you miss here. it. Get in line. Dennis yeah. Gartman is missing AI rarely. How about that position I have in NVIDIA? Yeah. It's huge. <laughs> exactly. Dennis, thank you so much. Congratulations again on a cold call, a gold call, I should say, that has silenced your many uh, critics. Futures up. See, Gartman driving the market higher, yep, green in the that. screen. Did you see that? Gartman sets up Perma Bear. Yep. And boom, up we go. Gold up another uh, $8.40, $2,354 well, per ounce of gold. Look I mean, at that. So Lisa can go into the Costco, go up and buy a, whatever it is you buy there gold-wise. I didn't even know that was a Take thing. it to the Maldives and sell it. Take it to the Maldives, sell it, get a hot dog along the way. And it's all you good. Know, it's great. Future's up 16. Down now, green in the screen, fractionally, ever so slightly. Gartman noticing the NASDAQ is up six-tenths of a percent. And the VIX 13.13. Garvin looking for that to go from 13 to 20, and that would be a <clears throat> correction in the market, yep. like a real correction. Yep. Like uh, we have a, a sell update, Tom. The Amtrak is running a little late today, so Mr. Balchunas, who lives oh, yeah. on the Acela, he's now claiming that he I, I cannot don't... be on the surveillance show because of Amtrak. Can I use excuse someday, you know, 4 a.m. when I get in? <laughs> exactly. Sparta, exactly. I'm sorry, I'm on the Excel. I'm on the Excella up Fifth Avenue. I right. Can't get in. There you go. It's not going to work. That's our mass transportation report. We will schedule. We'll speak to his people. Yep. One of his interns. We'll talk we'll to We'll schedule Amtrak Mr. And see what's going on. Bell and see you again. Be careful out there. On YouTube, Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning.
markets, headlines, and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo alongside Tom Keenan and Paul Sweeney with your opening bell report. So we have some more economic data out this week. ISM manufacturing report for May out in about a half hour from now. Later this week, we have the monthly unemployment report. Now, economists are saying the U.S. probably added about 180,000 jobs in May. That was similar to April. We shall see, but let's get see how the markets start off on this new trading week. We'll start with the S&P 500 up about four tenths of a percent, 21 points at 5,200. We'll go to the Dow. That's a little change, up about 15 points at 38,700. The Nasdaq up seven tenths of a percent. That's leading the charge up 129 points at 16,863. All right, we'll head to the bond market. The two-year yield 4.87 percent. That's little change. The 10-year yield 4.47 percent, and that's down three basis points. Check in with commodities. We have spot gold higher at 2,332 an ounce. Brent crude $80 a barrel. WTI crude 76. Dollars a barrel, and after the opening bell, yes, I want to check in with GameStop. They are now oh, up seventy-two percent. Check in with that. the other meme stocks. Got to go to AMC, up thirty-one percent. That is your Bloomberg opening bell report, Tom and Paul. Lisa Mateo, thanks. But Tom, so much. there's thirty-five million shares of GameStop have traded already. I mean, so there's I, real I dollars and cents being pushed around out there. It's amazing. I, I mean, I was too young to be under the buttonwood tree. Yep. But is this any different? I, I, I mean, I don't remember know. we read Reminiscence of a Stock Operator yep. and we said, my God, my grandparents, they were crooks. Yep, trading you halted know. here for GameStop. Tra Tra yeah. Two well, seconds you know, into it. You know, there you go. I'm going to blame Lisa on that one. Well, I, Can't I, I keep the stock open. We had Derek Wallbank with us from Delhi today. Yep. And out on YouTube live chat, good morning to all of you on the edge of the Arctic Circle. Tromso, Norway. Really? And this brings up a really important point, Paul. Thank you so much for listening uh, to Bloomberg Surveillance today. From way up, this is the best place to see the Northern Lights. Oh, I, it's, I, like, it's like a historic be, place. Right? It's like, you know, it's like they want to do the Olympics there. They're hoping to get the Winter Olympics there because it's be the first one above the Arctic Circle. Oh, holy cow, you're right. The high is 55, nice. and tonight it gets down to 47 degrees. And the whole point here, Lisa, help, help me out here. This shifts... <laughs> From like, I've got to go to Seville, or I've got to go to Middle Italy, or even Northern Italy, you know, like steamy, hot, it's not like it used to be. Okay. And does the whole tourist thing move north? Does the whole tourist thing move up to Oslo or Helsinki or, you know, I don't know. You know, name the other places I never go. <laughs> is Scott, is Scott we got to we, go. get you out of Paris, Tom. That's what we got to do. Well, yeah. you would go. That's, you know. I, I mean, yeah, I know you got your regular spots and everything. I love the, the YouTube live chat. I mean, good <laughs> yep. morning in Norway. Good morning in Mexico for that election uh, as well. Waiting by uh, patiently is Ira Jersey, uh, who's looking at uh, LIBOR 5.34% or whatever. Uh, Ira, what do you do? Uh, he's at Bloomberg Intelligence, fixed yeah. income. Ira, is one of our guests said, and Paul says repeatedly, would everybody stop overthinking it and just buy three months paper? What's the risk of buying a CD or three months paper at 5.x percent? There's probably not a big risk, Tom, in the short term. Uh, you, you know, so it, the issue becomes when you roll when you roll that uh, three month piece of paper three months from now is the Federal Reserve <laughs> going to be cutting interest rates, and if they do, you'll obviously make less, right? So, th so that's the uh, kind of the push and the pull for longer term investors. So, if you just have cash to put to work, we are seeing some people term out their um, their borrowing just a little bit, going into things like two year notes, making a little under five percent, but Locking right. that in for two years. So if the Fed does cut interest rates 100 basis points or 150 basis points over the next year and a half, you're you're still making and guaranteed to make that, uh, you know, 4.9 ish percent. Should should somebody be buying the nominal yield piece or some fancy inflation adjusted piece that Ira Jersey only knows about? 
So uh, above 2%, you, you know, the, a lot of people, the, the issue with looking at things like tips, and that's what you're talking about, buying real yield. So buying uh, the yields above inflation um, is if you go back to when that whole product started in the late 90s, uh, real yields were upwards of 4%, and now they're half of that. They're at 2%. But it seems to it seems to us here at Bloomberg Intelligence that some any, any real yield above 2% um, doesn't seem unattractive to us. So if you think about uh, if you buy a uh, 10-year tip, for example, at 2%, you're talking about uh, making that plus whatever inflation is. The risk that you have there is that in, is that interest rates go higher, right? So that there's more risk, there's a lot of debt outstanding. Um, if deficits get worse, you tend to see real yields rise even more. Um, now, you know, right now that the government's kind of in a steady state, um, but, but that's the risk environment. But if inflation does increase because uh, it, you know, be, because of things like more fiscal stimulus, then you have a, at least a little bit of protection compared to nominals, and, and that's what that's what you have to remember is that if you buy tips, you're not really hedging inflation; you're hedging the worst case scenario of buying mm -hmm. a nominal treasury. Ira, uh, you and Lisa Abramowitz tell me that I should really pay attention to those treasury auctions. I do not because I have a life, but you guys do. I know we had some auctions last week. What happened, and what did they tell you about the market? Yeah, for, so for those of us without a life, Paul, we uh, um, yeah yeah. So, so last week's auctions were not particularly good. In fact, they were uh, it was the worst string uh, that I can certainly remember uh, in a, a long time. We had three auctions; they were all pretty poor last week. Um, demand was somewhat weaker, um, but at the same time, you know, we've subsequently rallied from there. So so we basically had weak auctions. People didn't show up to the auctions; uh, they tailed, which means that they came above what the market was expecting at the time the auction closed um, in terms of yield, but people then uh, subsequently have purchased uh, bonds in the secondary market. So, um, and, and I think part of that might have been some of the timing of some of the auctions because it was a short week. You had uh, issuance on Friday, you had two auctions on Tuesday, one auction on Wednesday, and people kind of maybe missed the cycle and weren't really prepared in their trading books to, uh, to absorb all of that supply. And there was a lot of supply. Last Tuesday was was one of the busiest debt auction days in history. So, okay. um, so, so there was a lot of kind of you know paper that needed to be taken down. All right, Ira, for you interest rate watchers and for the ec economists out there, there's a lot of economic data here. As I look at my Eco Go calendar, I got ISM, ISM Manufacturing uh, today, Wednesday, I got ISM Services, I got a big labor number on Friday. What do you think the Fed's looking at these days? Yeah, they're looking at a little bit of everything, uh, you, you know. That, but I think you know the payroll numbers is certainly what the the treasury market moves the most on. So, um, so obviously that's going to get a, a lot of attention. W what's been interesting is this dynamic where the treasury market, in particular, uh, is now focusing more on the hard data. So it used to be that you know if ISM new orders came out really good or really bad, the treasury market would move. Now what you're seeing is that the uh, the, the hard data, so things like payrolls retail sales, the CPI data, the, the treasury market is following those and kind of ignoring the uh, any any misses or beats in survey data. So the ISM data, even though I still think it's important for a longer term, mid midterm to longer term gauge of how the economy is going to do, right. uh, the treasury market right now is, is kind of discounting that versus looking at things like payrolls and retail sales. And now, folks, it's time for the obligatory soccer talk. We do that on Monday here. Mm -hmm. Moments ago, Ira Jersey, the guy I love from France, the way he goes down the field, Mbappe, who I, you know, I'm not an expert on this. I leave it to Faro in Jersey. It's just signed for $245 million wow. with Real Madrid. What does that mean in your world of soccer? That a 25-year-old is going to get $245 million nice. over five years. I guess he gets to re-up again <laughs> after that. What does that do to the world of big league soccer, Ira Jersey? Well, you are talking about one of the generational talents here. You know, we we are we're kind of at the end of the Messi Ronaldo era, and and Kylian Mbappe is coming into his prime now. So, you know, he's get obviously getting paid for his uh, his extreme talent. Um, look, Real Madrid just won the Champions League, and now they're even beefing up even more with one of the right. uh, the two or three best players in the world right now. So it, it's it's right. hard to see how Real Madrid is not going to at least make a deep run in the Champions League again next season. Why, why did um, he if not win it again? Why did he not? 
not go to the Premier League, the one that everybody here watches, including Lisa Mateo? Well, that, that's that's an interesting question. I mean, a question you have to ask for him, ask him about. Um, I suspect that part of it's just money. You know, when you think about some of the, the <clears throat> big clubs in the world, five of them, maybe five or six of them are in the Premier League, but then you'd still have Real Madrid, Barcelona, Bayern Munich, which are right. clubs that just about everyone, if they're paid enough money, is going to go to. People aren't going to say no to those clubs. I mean, mm -hmm. Real Madrid had the Galacticos right. era where they, they basically absorbed all the best players in the world, you know, right. the David Beckhams and, and the like. Right. So, uh, you know, maybe they're just trying to do that yeah. again. Rich, was that enough soccer talk for June? <laughs> oh, he's going to have a hard Does that attack. like get us through the months? <laughs> exactly. Ira Jersey, thank you so much. Aston Villa free there. Uh, and I should point out Mr. Jersey's commitment to kids soccer plus across America. An ownership stake deal. in Real Central New Jersey. Yeah. The minor league soccer. Yeah. He's all into this. He's actually stuff. like, like he, really authoritative yes. in the time he's put in with the kids of New Jersey. I mean, you can't just do that. No, no like some people talk, others do. And Ira yes. Jersey has been the doer out in the field at 40, yep. 40 degrees sleet. Yes, exactly. In July. Yeah. Red and green on the screen right now. We are open for trading NASDAQ up a solid seven tenths of a percent. With our news in New York City, Michael Barr. Tom, Paul, Lisa, Hunter Biden's trial begins with a jury selection this morning in Delaware. He's at the courthouse right now. The president's son pleaded not guilty to lying about his drug use when he bought a gun six years ago. Tom Dupree is a former Department of Justice official. This is going to be an exquisitively painful ordeal for Hunter Biden. He is going to sit in that courtroom and hear testimony from people who were among the closest people to him in his life, testifying against him in the most personal terms. Former DOJ official Tom Dupree. The trial is expected to last one to two weeks with opening statements, possibly by the end of today. Hunter Biden also faces federal tax charges in California, which he also pleaded not guilty to, but that case was pushed back until September. President Biden plans to sign an executive order tightening measures at the U.S.-Mexico border as soon as tomorrow. Bloomberg's Amy Morris has the latest from our 99.1 newsroom in Washington. The move comes after another failed push to pass bipartisan legislation to address the border. And as the administration has rolled out smaller steps to speed certain deportations, no official word yet from the White House, but Biden has said the U.S. should have a higher threshold for those with asylum claims, people who cross the border, and appeal to stay on humanitarian grounds. Now, Biden has been considering unilateral action to deal with the migrant crisis since Republicans killed a bipartisan deal that would have given the president fresh funding and powers. In Washington, Amy Morris Bloomberg Radio. Former government health official Dr. Anthony Fauci is set to publicly testify on Capitol Hill today for the first time in two years. It's expected to be a fiery hearing led by House Republicans as Fauci is expected to face questions about social distancing, masking, and remote schooling. Some panel members want to know whether guidance on those issues approved by the CDC director was based on science. Finally, a shout out to Simone Biles, the gymnastics star, cruised to a record ninth Amazing. U.S. championship. That woman is 27 years old. She's 27. Okay. 27. Oh, wow. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with the Bloomberg News Now. I'm Michael Barr, and this is Bloomberg. Tom Ball, Lisa. Thank you for bringing this up. And, and you know, I, 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 have, I, I could never do a forward roll. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah. during gym, gym, gym class, like in eighth grade, they say, I, I couldn't do that. Mr. Either. King, here, go get a slide roll. Go over yeah. there and play with your math. But she's 27, <laughs> yeah. which is basically ancient. That's, uh, right. Yes, in gymnastics years, <laughs> yes, it is. But you, you see her out there, and it's like, my goodness. Is so she'll be on the Olympic team, right? She better be yes, on the right, Olympic exactly. team. Okay. I know the sure. trials are coming up okay. very soon, but I'm sure she's got okay. a spot. So. Right. That'll be good. I, could, I remember this very quickly. I tried to do a forward roll in <laughs> gym class, yeah. and there was a wall that was next to, that was plaster next to the other classroom, and I broke the wall. Yeah. And my parents had to pay for it because uh, I'm clumsy. Oh, yeah. boy, there you go. Yeah. I'm just saying. Know. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and Lisa's you know. doing aerial yoga. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. she's yeah. like bendable and all that. And I can touch my toes. Yeah. Oh, well, that's, that's uncomfortable. You can for. touch your oh. That's a sore subject. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's really, we used to sit on the ice with our skates on and put our palms on the ice. Oh. That was five or six years ago. <laughs> Good morning from New York, Bloomberg Surveillance.
headlines and breaking news 24 hours a day on Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television, and the Bloomberg Business App. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. From the Bloomberg Interac Interactive Broker Studio, I'm Lisa Mateo. We have the tech-heavy NASDAQ leading the gains on this new trading week, up 1%, 167 points at 16,902. Uh, the S&P 500 up four tenths of a percent, 24 points at 5,301. The Dow, little change, down 19 points at 3, uh, 38,665. The two-year yield, 4.86. 2%. Uh, that's down one basis point. The 10-year yield, 4.45%, and that's down three basis points. Want to take a little digger deep into those NASDAQ, into the NASDAQ, because if you look closer, the 11 major industry groups on the IMAX feature, feature of your terminal, the biggest pull coming from information technology. You got that right. You go deeper, you see semiconductors. At the top is NVIDIA. Those shares right now, well, they're up about 4%. Qualcomm also right behind it. Qualcomm shares up 3%. And AMD also made that list up about 1%. The CEOs of NVIDIA, AMD made some pretty big AI announcements in Taiwan. That's the reason they're higher this morning. Also making news, hedge fund manager Bill Ackman, he sold a 10% stake in Pershing Square. That's ahead of a planned IPO. It's a deal valuing the company at more than $10 billion. That is your Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Hey, Lisa, thanks so much. Uh, the tech area, I, I mean, I'm sorry, we're just just opening up here, what are we? We're a vast 10, I can do the math, 17 minutes into the day, Paul. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at NVIDIA. I mean, is it a meme stock or is it like, so it's a jump condition. It's right up near highs. It's not there yet, 11.38. Yep. What do you do with that? I mean, uh, 10 yeah. for one stock spit. I, my first I math was $970, not, was $97. Yep. And now no, it's $113. You know, the bulls the bulls will come in here, Tom, and they'll say, buy it. This is AI. This is a 10-year trade, right. and I don't know. So that's what we hear. Sport, to say the least. Uh, we're going to digress here. And it's a good time to digress on this when it's come to clipping coupons or total return. And this is, you know, I think of Dan Fuss at Loomis Sales, who really oh, yeah. invented strategic, in, strategic income processes, if you will. Andrew Cizorowski joins us now. Mortgage and Securitized Investment Team at Morgan Stanley here on clipping a coupon or finding total return. What does your June look like, Andrew? How big a headache is this with spread so narrow, price to perfection? Where do you find opportunity in mortgage and securitized investment? Yeah, thanks for having me. So, you know, as you mentioned, spreads are tight in fixed income, but actually one of the areas where, where spreads are still kind of wide of historical norms is actually in, you know, the AAA U.S. government agency backed mortgage backed security market. And, and there's some there's been some negative technicals there. Obviously, we had the regional bank issues back last March. We've had the Fed ongoing right. quantitative tightening program, but agency MBS spreads are sitting around um, 145 over treasuries, which is wider than a triple B corporate. So, so in a strategic income fund like we run, you know, you can actually stay up in quality and actually not okay. give up much in the way of yields at this time. I mean, I remember the miracle known as Ginny May. Oh yeah, remember that, Paul? Yeah. Friday and and May. Andrew, what it comes down to, and you just gave me the number, if I decide to buy, basically triple A, quasi triple A packaged securitized stuff i pick up 1.45 percentage points in yield from treasuries yes yeah that's correct and and obviously if you you know if you instead of going into kind of corporates and taking some credit risk there we think that's a nice place to hide out while again spreads are tight in a lot of different markets so it's, it's a place you can kind of wait and see what happens with the economy is the economy slowing is it rolling over if that is the case, then corporate spread should widen a little bit from here. And kind of our favorite trade in, in the strategic income fund I run is, is literally just, we have about 40% of the fund just kind of parking in higher coupon agency MBS because there's a big difference between high coupon and low coupon. Basically all those mortgages that were created between 2020 and 2022, um, you know, you have know, longer durations, you know. they extended. <laughs> Um, and the nice yeah. thing about the agency MBS index is the negative convexity in the market is the, is oh, some of the lowest it's ever been. Convexity. Andrew, he was up at Durham at UNH. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's so boring up there. I mean, it's <laughs> deadly. Andrew's the only one I know who read Fabozzi cover to cover. And that's all there is to it. Hey, Andrew, my, my, my ski buddy, Jim from Summit, New Jersey, was a big-time hedge fund manager on Wall Street for decades. Now he's retired. So I asked him for some ideas. He tells me he's just rolling T-bills these days. That's it. I mean, how boring is that? Talk to us about yeah, I mean, the T-bill market. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, that, that's kind of uh, going with uh, Tom's kind of triple levered cash fund. I think that's, uh, you know, but be careful now. We're in day. registration. Stop. We, can, yeah. we, we can't talk yeah. about it, Andrew, on air. I mean, registration on the Forple leveraged ETF. <laughs> Continue. All right, all right. We'll, we'll, we'll keep that tabled for, for next time. Um, but but I think that, look, rolling T-bills, that's been a great trade. Obviously, bond yields sold off uh, last year and then kind of to start the year around 60 basis points this year. But at the end of the day, markets, the bond market's going to be forward looking. And I think with the Fed telling us that basically signaling that kind of hikes are off the table, I think at the end of the day, you want to start kind of moving out the curve a little bit and kind of extending your duration. It's something we've been doing in our fund. It's something I think investors, if you wait for that first cut to come, whether that's in September or December, it's going to be too late by then. Again, bond markets move ahead of the Fed. Bond markets are going to move ahead of this. So if you wait to do that, you could be giving up a kind of a 50 basis point rally in Treasury yield. So, so again, it's been a trade that works, and there's a lot of cash that's sitting there waiting for that. And I think at the end of the day, though, you want to you want to move out the curve a little. You don't have to take a ton of again. You don't have to take a ton of credit risk at this time because you're not being compensated to do so. But do extend out extend out the curve, go into the kind of three to five year points. That's where we think the the most value is on the kind of Treasury curve. Hey, Andrew, what are single family rental bonds? And do I want to get some exposure to those things? Oh, great question. Yeah. yeah so, so if you think about the, the housing market, obviously there, there's the you know, U.S. government agency, MBS market, uh, which, which is where most mortgages kind of go through. But then there's also another market, and that's the, there's kind of these single family rental operators who, who issue bonds that have kind of they, they own thousands of homes. They build homes to, to rent in, in some cases. And, and these are basically, you could get anywhere from kind of triple B to double B bonds that are kind of, could be anywhere from three to 400 over and they're floating rates. So they float off that front end of the curve. So you could be talking kind of mid eights to mid 9% yields. And it's just a nice alternative to something like maybe a high yield Listen bond while you're, you're you know, okay. and, and it has a nice hedge because if you think about the, how expensive mortgages are today, and if it's unaffordable in most places to buy a home, well, right. you're actually kind of locked in to renting. Andrew, you sound like you're taking advantage of tax-free bonds. <laughs> Come on, you're telling me, Yield Hog, that it's 9% pop on these single family or whatever rent, housing rental bonds. What's the downside? Yeah, look, the downside, it, it could be one of two things. One, you have a big housing correction, which we just don't think is, is going to occur at this time. Obviously, I think there's reasons the housing market's not as strong as it seems because there's just no supply. But the other thing that could be a, a, a big a big recession where people lose their jobs, they can't afford to pay their rents. Um, we think both of those, again, are, are kind of low likelihood. So it's a space, you got to take right. some kind of risk in this market. So and I, that's a space where we think it, it makes sense to take some right. risk. and. and Andrew, thank you. Andrew Cesarowski, thank you so much. With Morgan Stanley, really informed. I learned I a lot there. Boston, part of the you know, old Eaton Vance team. Yeah, it's the Eaton Vance team. And they, were. And they were, I mean, Eaton Vance was you know. just a classic yeah. game up in Boston. They called up Doe's. They said, hire the kid from UNH. And yep. they did. That's all there is yeah. to it. We get a quick update now from surveillance congestion tax correspondent, John Tucker. John Tucker, it's June, 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 June. Oh, boy. Is there a Tucker countdown clock? To the congestion. Well, tax. and one more lawsuit from <clears throat> truckers this time who say it's going to be too expensive. And then, you know, that's going to add to the rate of inflation, especially for people in midtown Manhattan, because yeah. they're yeah. going to pay more. They're going to pass those costs on. So who knows? <laughs> the MTA, the uh, congestion tax is going to go into effect at the end of June, but uh, another lawsuit. So do you delayed. seriously, do you presume in your reading of this that all this litigation will be solved? Yes. Through the month of June? Uh, is there like I don't a pressure? know if it's going to be that quickly, but uh, one of the venues is a federal court in Newark, New Jersey. So, you know. So knows? you expect this will not go into effect by the end of the month, like scheduled? If I'm going to game this right now, Since I would gonna say gonna to... it's going to be delayed. Okay. Okay. But we understand. And we are creating on the, Bloomberg, on the Bloomberg expense portal, we are creating a separate line for the. Are we? Uh, yes, I'm taking I'm, I'm Maybe spearheading you are. that. We're spearheading that for John Tucker right. so we can put in that, that expense. How's the helix look in this heat? We're up to 90 degrees today, they said as well. Does, does, the, helix, does the helix sag like the wires of a train sag? No, you know, that's an important problem. The Canterbury wires like NJ Transit and whatever, they oh, just sag. So that is, that is a problem. Yep, yeah. Very Cantonary math.
And really so good. do uh, the major wires in the entire grid. When it gets hot, those wires do sag. Very See? good. More prone to hitting trees, etc. Don't we so. all? Thank you, John Tucker. <laughs> Greatly appreciate that. This has been a great Monday. Great setting us. Thank you, Dennis Gartman on Gold. Mr. Petty. Yeah.